chief justice of the Philippines, and the associate justice of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons have existed before the Honorable Supreme Court of the Philippines shall give their attention for the court now in session. Call the case. Your Honors, good afternoon. For today's oral argument are the consol consolidated 37 petitions assailing the constitutionality of Republic Act 11479, the Anti Terrorism Act of 2020. Uh, appearances for the uh, petitioners. May I request the representing counsel for petitioners to please make your appearances. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Respectfully appearing for the petitioners in DR number 25276, Petitioner Senior and former Senior Associate Justice Antonio Di Carpio and former Justice uh, Parker Morales. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Respectfully appearing for the petitioners in DR number 27277. 252747, NUJPF, Your Honor, Evelyn Osua. For the respondents, please. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honors. <clears throat> uh, my, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, I'm Solicitor General Jose C. Calida. And uh, the others are ASD Marisa de la Cruz Galandines, ASG Rex Bernardo Pascual, ASG Raymond Rigodon, State Solicitor Eduardo Pocas Jr., Associate Solicitor Kyle Brian Guerrero, Your Honors. For the amicus curry, you see here. Yeah. Uh, Chief Justice and Honorable Justices, uh, uh, Francis Adeles has amicus curry in obedience to the order of the court. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Justice. Your Honours, I'm Representative Angel Filagman, Petitioner in DR number 252579. Thank you, Your Honours. Okay. The Congressman is recognized as one of the counsel of the petitioner. You're appearing as a counsel for the petitioner or you're appearing as petitioner yourself, Congressman? Your Honour, both as the counsel and, and petitioner. Counsel. We will take note of that. Thank you, Your okay. Honor. Any other appearances? No more? Now, who among the petitioners? Okay, go ahead, please. Neri Colmenares, Your Honor, for the petitioners, Your Honor. Also as petitioner and counsel at yes, the same time. Okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Your Honor. I'm attorney Algamar Lati for DR 25275. No more, no more appearances. So, who among the petitioners will first argue its position? 
who are among, who are among the petitioners. Who will be the first one? Okay, go ahead then. Honorable Chief Justice and Honorable Associate Justices of the Supreme Court, good afternoon. To start, allow me to convey petitioners' deepest gratitude and thanks to this honorable court for conducting these oral arguments and over the persistent objection of the respondents. Yes, we are facing a health crisis. So too are we as a nation with the passage and implementation of the anti-terror law, facing a real and imminent danger to both our constitutionally protected civil liberties and separation of powers. As petitioners will show, the anti-terror law is constitutionally infirm and does more harm to our civil liberties than providing security against the evils that it seeks to curtail. In battling terrorism, it formally sanctions the following, warrantless arrests and prolonged detention, unreasonable searches and seizures, unwarranted intrusion into private communications and correspondence, curtailment of expression and assembly, denial of bail, the presumption of innocence and access to public information. These sanctioned intrusions on our civil liberties are strictly enjoined by the Constitution. To paraphrase People versus Sapla, this battle waged against terror that tramples upon the rights of the people is actually a war against the people. Thus, the petitioners in this case are invoking this honorable court's judicial power under the Constitution to assert the supremacy of the people's fundamental rights under the Constitution. I thus respectfully submit your honors that the filing of the petitions in this case is proper and warranted for the following reason. First, the petitioners have legal standing to file the petitions as the instant case concerns our Bill of Rights, which are public rights. Some of the petitioners have even been characterized by state elements as aiding terrorists. Thus, there is a credible threat of prosecution against said petitioners. Second, the constitutionality of the anti-terror law is ripe for the judicial review. Its key provisions violate the Bill of Rights, and since it was enacted in violation of the proper procedure, it was passed with grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or in excess of jurisdiction, for which the Constitution has entrusted to this honorable court the duty to strike it down. Third, there exists an actual case or controversy. Apart from being impressed with grave abuse of discretion, the anti-terror law chills the exercise of expression by the petitioners. Hence, an actual and judicial controversy exists. Fourth, the direct resort to this honorable court is sanctioned under the law. This is a case of transcendental importance, considering that the Houses of Congress enacted the anti-terror law and considering further that the question of constitutionality is raised at the earliest opportunity and is the least mota of the case, it is proper for this honorable court to resolve the same. To this, I quote again People versus Sapla. 
the Bill of Rights should never be sacrificed on the altar of convenience. The malevolent mantle of the rule of men dislodges the rule of law. In truth and in the grand scheme of things, this is not a battle between the petitioners and government, nor their respective council, but it is a colossal battle between the Constitution and the anti-terror law. Presently, the anti-terror law is running roughshod over the Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights. We thus come to plead with you, your honors, to snatch our Constitution from the jaws of defeat and restore its primacy against the anti-terror law. To paraphrase Winston Churchill, we shall not fail nor falter, we shall not weaken nor tire, neither the sudden shock of battle nor the long drawn trial of vigilance and exertion will wear us down. Your honors, please give us the tool. Please uphold our constitution over the anti-terror law and we will protect the constitution with all our might. Thus, uh, the petitions must be given due course. Once again, I thank your honors for this opportunity to present this matter to you and wish everyone here with the blessings of family, good health, peace, and safety. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Can we now hear uh, Attorney Jokno? May it please the court. This is a case of first impression. The Anti-Terrorism Act of the ATA is novel in many ways, but what makes it stand out is the fact that it's the only law in our country that includes the exercise of civil and political rights in its definition of a crime. While Section 4 of the Act provides that, quote, terrorism shall not include advocacy, protest, and similar exercises of civil and political rights, unquote, it quickly adds, which are not intended to cause death or serious physical harm, to endanger a person's life, or create a serious risk to public safety. As the Anti-Terrorism Council recognized in the law's IRR that is shown in Exhibit A, one who exercises basic rights may still be liable for terrorism if he or she is impelled by the requisite intent and purpose. No other law makes the exercise of constitutional rights a crime when actuated by a certain intent. No other law empowers the state to arrest its people for exercising rights guaranteed by the Constitution based solely on a law enforcer's subjective opinion of their state of mind. Petitioners actively engage in the exercise of civil and political rights. By including such exercise in its definition of terrorism, the law puts petitioners smack in the hot zone of proscribed criminal activity. The sword that the law dangles over their heads is real. The chilling effect on their rights is palpable. Being directly aggrieved by the ATA, petitioners urge the court to strike it down. It is impermissibly vague and overbroad and fails the strict scrutiny test. It also tramples on our fundamental rights and freedoms. First, the law punishes speech based on its content. Section four defining terrorism mentions advocacy, protests, and mass actions, which are all forms of expression. Section nine punishes inciting others by means of speech to commit terrorism. Sections five, six, eight, and 10 punish threats and proposals to commit terrorism training and recruitment of terrorists, and membership in a terrorist organization, all of which involve speech. Second, as a content-based regulation of speech, the law comes to court with a heavy presumption of unconstitutionality and a heavy burden on government to prove otherwise. To discharge that burden, government must prove both a compelling state interest and the least restrictive means to achieve that interest. Third, government has not met that burden. The law's definition of terrorism is not narrowly drawn and unnecessarily sweeps protected speech and conduct into its domain. 
The law's definition of terrorism has two elements. The first essential element occurs when a person engages in any of the acts shown on the left column of Exhibit B. The second element occurs when the purpose of such act by its nature and context is any of those shown on the right column of Exhibit B. The ATA offers a smorgasbord of acts, intents, and purposes. But what makes the law unpalatable is the fact that it dispenses with the requirements of a predicate crime, which appears to be the norm among nations, and replaces it with acts intended to cause death, etc. Since intent is generally inferred from a person's acts, the law gives state agents the power to arrest any citizen based on their subjective impression of their intent. Worse, it allows the state to simply presume the existence of intent from the citizen's acts, even if the acts themselves do not constitute a crime. Anyone, therefore, who tweets for people to attend a peaceful rally could be arrested for engaging in acts intended to endanger a person's life due to the danger of COVID infection. That is Exhibit C. Anyone who posts on Facebook for the people to boycott a digital services company owned by someone close to the president or who engages in a transport strike could be arrested for engaging in acts intended to cause extensive interference with critical infrastructure, since the term includes telecommunications and transportation. If this law had existed in 1986, Archbishop Cardinal Sin's call for people power would easily qualify as inciting to terrorism. By exhorting the people to gather at EDSA, Cardinal Sin incited them to engage in acts intended to cause extension, extensive interference with critical infrastructure and to endanger people's lives. People power brought Metro Manila to a standstill, disrupted essential public services, and had a debilitating impact on national defense, security, and public safety. Cardinal Skin's call would also qualify as seriously destabilizing fundamental political structure and creating a public emergency. These are but some examples of how the law invades areas protected by the Constitution. In closing, to borrow the words of an esteemed member of this court, quote, rather than a scalpel to precisely remove a specific evil, unquote, the law, quote, carelessly wields a wayward machete, striking blows on the fundamental rights of Filipinos, end quote. We implore the honorable court to strike down this law before it inflicts a mortal wound on the rights and freedoms that give life to our cherished democracy. Thank you, Mr. Rodgers. Attorney uh, Molo, yes. Molo. Yeah. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Along with Professors Tito Liban, Gwen De Vera, Darwin Angeles, I represent former Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio, former Justice Conchita Carpio Morales, National Security Expert Francisco Acidillo, UP's Constitutional Law Professors, and UP student Tyrone Santos. I was given three topics. First, severability. Our position is that the ATA cannot survive the nullity of its key provision. The law relies on a concept that seeps into its every crack. Not even a saving clause works. Second, it is our position that the repeal of the HSA cannot operate in a manner that deprives vested constitutional rights or in violation of our international obligations. Third, as to the vagueness and overbreath of sections 5 to 14, we observe that the objections fall within three general categories. The first category of objections argue that because of section 4's new definition of terrorism, escapes consistent meaning, other provisions become vague as well. If we are not sure what terrorism is, then we can't be sure what inciting or proposing it covers. The second category focuses on specific phrases, like Section 6, which punishes, and I quote, collecting and making documents connected with the preparation of terrorism. Now, broad formulations like this are unconstitutional both here and abroad. In U.S. v. Stevens, in 2010, Chief Justice Roberts in a nullified a penal law facially because although it was meant to punish depictions of animal cruelty, it was actually punishing innocent acts like a butcher or a slaughterhouse. 
Section 6 fails Stevens' analysis because it covers an author writing about Philippine terrorists or a filmmaker making a documentary of terrorists. The third category of objections refer to the APA provisions applied as a whole, like designation combined with Section 4 and 10, which covers those who may not even know what they did wrong, like people added to Viber groups involuntarily, or our grandchildren who may have joined a BTS fans club online that transformed into something different. It doesn't matter. Under the APA sex, they're all members. They can be designated and they can be detained for 24 days. The OSD argues, well then just construe to include knowledge or intent, but the text doesn't say that. And penal laws are strictly construed against the state and any presumption of constitutionality is lost when a law affects fundamental rights. The government says we are twisting the APA, but dismisses the point. The very fact that a penal law is susceptible to multiple readings makes it vague. The classic example is a speed limit. Don't go faster than 60 kilometers per hour invites no debate. But here, just days after the APA was signed, the president was already disagreeing with the principal author of the law on what designation covers. If even they can't agree, what more the law's enforcers? They say only terrorists should fear this law. But terrorism under this new law is not the old terrorist we imagined. According to the OSG, the APA is a flexible, adaptive law by design. This is the price. Nuns who have been teaching our youth for centuries are accused of corrupting the youth. The same charge used to execute Socrates. More, our client, Justice Carpio, is defending the country from an incursion, along with Justice Carpio Morales, was called out for stoking conflict with China. This is punishable under the ATA, and in fact, under Section 25, China can ask that both justices be designated as terrorists. The government argues as if the ATA is an ordinary penal law, like illegal parking. It is not. Since 1987, there has been no law that sweeps so many constitutional rights. And since 1987, no law has threatened to diminish the judiciary by directly taking away its powers and giving it to the executive. The APA does both. To quote Justice Sarmiento, it was a long and horrible nightmare when our people's rights, freedoms, and liberties were sacrificed at the altar of national security. In closing, your honors, we revised our constitution on this very day to prevent horrors like this 34 years ago. If there were any case in the minds of the framers when they created expanded judicial review, this, this is that case. Someday, the political branches may yet undermine the judicial branch, and perhaps the light of democracy in this country may dim once again. But please, let it not be under this honorable court's watch. To your honors, we entrust the fate of our constitution, the dignity of our judges, and the lives of generations of Filipinos. Uh, Attorney Orsoa, you are recognized. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Your Honors, allow me to share an actual case that illustrates the unconstitutionality of the powers of the of the Anti-Terrorism Council or the ATC and the AMLC and the resulting violations of basic human rights and freedoms. In December 2019, the Rural Missionaries of the Philippines or the RMP, one of the petitioners here, was shocked to know that his bank accounts have been frozen on orders of the AMLC without the, A without the RMP knowing why until about nine months later after the AMLC initiated a petition for civil forfeiture with the Regional Trial Court of Manila. The AMLC based its freeze order on mere claims by purported former rebels that the RMP finances communist rebels in Mindanao. Since the freezing of the bank accounts was made ex parte, the RMP was deprived of the right to refute before an impartial tribunal the witnesses' self-serving claims 
and to show that all their bank transactions were lawful. The Court of Appeals extended the AMLC's freeze order for six months, also without the RMP being informed of the proceedings. The RMP's 10 bank accounts remain frozen to this day. The RMP is an organization of women and men, religious and lay workers from various congregations doing missionary work with the rural poor. With their bank deposits still frozen, the RMP had to close its Quezon City office. It has since been unable to pursue its apostolic work. After the RMP filed the petition for writs of Amparo and habeas data against the NPF LCAC officials, its former national coordinator, 81-year-old Sister Elenita Belardo, was charged with perjury by the ATC and the NPF LCAC Vice Chairperson Esperon. Section 25 of the APA institutionalizes this practice of designating persons or organizations as terrorists and terrorist financiers behind closed doors without notice and hearing and without any remedy in law. This power is given to the ATC, a mere administrative agency. Its designation of persons or organizations as terrorists is based on its sole determination of probable cause. And according to its arbitrary interpretation of the vague and overbroad definition of terrorism, its power is absolute since there is no remedy to contest the designation. Its designation creates a conclusive presumption of guilt without due process. The ATC's absolute power to designate terrorists is not harmless or benign. The designation results in violation, restriction, and deprivation of rights, even without prosecution and conviction by a court of law. Under Rule 6.5, the designation of terrorists by the ATC is required to be published. On the basis of the ATC's designation, the person so designated could be arrested and detained and, and worse, killed. Your Honors, consider the present context. The red tagging of activists and others critical of the government has led to deadly results. Authorities publicly tagged Attorney Benjamin Ramos, activist Dara Alvarez, and many others as communists or terrorists before they were killed. Recently, the AFP publicly and falsely designated some UP alumni as NPA terrorists who were either killed or captured. The AFP included in the list three lawyers, a former government official, a respected private practitioner and notarian, and a former IBP president. They also included a Palanca awardee who wrote many plays that we loved, such as Rap of Ages, and an internationally known expert in social entrepreneurship. They are all alive, they never joined the NPA, and they were never captured. Even the late Ben Cervantes, a multi-awarded and highly respected theater pioneer and director who died of illness, was not spared. There are only a few of the many who have been falsely accused of terrorism. They have been publicly vilified. Their reputations have been damaged and their very lives have been put at risk. Practices like this will become legal through the ATC's absolute power of designation. Solely on the, on the basis of the ATC's designation of terrorists, the AMLC can examine deposits and investments even without any court authorization under section 35. This is what happened to Gabriela, one of the petitioners here. The AMLC, upon the mere request of the NTF ECLAC, investigated Gabriela's financial and bank transactions without any court authorization in violation of Gabriela's rights. In Section 36, the AMLC is also empowered to issue an order ex parte to freeze deposits or investments even without any court authorization. 
this freeze order could effectively be indefinite under paragraph 3 of section 36, amounting to actual deprivation of property. No safeguards are provided under section 36. These sections violate the principle of separation of powers, due process, and the constitutional right against unreasonable searches and seizures. The vast powers of the ATC include the power to require private entities and individuals to provide assistance in its work under Section 46M, a power without parameters, safeguards, or conditions. With this absolute power, individuals and entities have no right at all to decline compliance, a clear violation of the constitutional prohibition against involuntary servitude. The ATC is also empowered to gather, keep, and utilize any and all information that it deems important of any person, group, or organization under Section 46 without any limitation or fear of scrutiny or disclosure, since it could adopt any security classification of its records under Section 45. Even the writ of habeas data could not be employed against its absolute power. These sections violate the constitutional right to privacy of communication and correspondence and to due process. By its absolute nature, Section 45 violates the ruling of this court in Sereno versus Committee on Trade and Related Matters. Finally, Your Honors, the implementing rules and regulations of the ATA attempt to rectify the flaws of the law by supplementing or qualifying its provisions. This only shows that the ATA has failed to meet the completeness and sufficient standard tests with its vague and overbroad definitions and grant of arbitrary powers, making Section 54 an undue delegation of legislative powers to the ATC and the DOJ. But even with those attempts, the implementing rules and regulations have not and could not cure the unconstitutionality of the ATA. Thank you, Your Honors. The Liberal uh, Minaris is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors, please. I was assigned to argue that various sections of RA 11479 violate inter alia the constitutional prohibition against bills of attainder and ex post facto laws. At its core, the Anti Terrorism Act today is today's oppressive and arbitrary legislative vehicle for the attribution of guilt and the imposition of punishment essentially without the need for judicial trial. Firstly, Your Honors, the law is constitutionally invalid because it suffers from overbreath and impermissible vagueness. The law punishes any act, including acts which were perfectly innocent when done for as long as the Anti-Terrorism Council, acting as roving lawmakers and star chamber judges, imputes vaguely defined terrorist intentions and purposes on the suspect. After all, who would know what acts are encompassed by a law that penalizes any act intended to endanger another person's life or seriously interfere with critical infrastructure? Worse, the act need not even actually result in endangering a person's life. The mere naked imputation that it intended to endanger a person's life would suffice. The law peddlers claim that under Section 4, there is a provision that excludes the exercise of civil and political rights from the ambit of terrorism, provided they are not intended to cause serious and physical harm on another person or create a serious risk uh, to public safety. A person exercising a constitutional right through artistic and cultural expressions today would suddenly be committing a crime tomorrow upon the mere imputation by the respondents that such artistic expression was intended to create serious risk to public safety. Clearly, therefore, your honors, the mere imputation of intentions and purposes by the respondents suddenly goes into past conduct and transforms acts considered legal and constitutional when done 
into punishable terrorist acts. The effect of the supposed safeguard, therefore, is to actually ex and expressly provide that said legal and constitutional acts can be considered terrorism on the mere say-so of the authorities of a vague and overbroad law, immediately opening up the law to vulnerability of being a bill of attainder and an ex post facto law. Secondly, your honors, RA 11479 inflicts deprivation of rights on a class of suspected persons without judicial trial when it grants respondents the power to investigate and freeze assets of suspects or cause the detention of suspects for more than three days without need for judicial imprimatur. Suspects who are charged in court and granted bail cannot enjoy the benefits of their fundamental right to liberty because their movements and means of communication are restricted under Section 34. Actually, the provisions granting judicial intervention under the law is a mirage. The provision on bailable offenses, for example, for inciting or proposing to commit terrorism, which are punishable by 12 years and therefore bailable, is also an illusion because these acts also constitute the same acts under Section 4, which is penalized with life imprisonment. There is no reason for the ATC, therefore, to file any case on, for violation of Sections 5 to 12 because all this can easily be prosecuted under the vague, overbroad, and non-bailable offense through terrorism under Section 4. Any one of these intrusions into traditionally recognized areas of protected freedoms clearly amount to punishment within the purview of the Bill of Attainder Clause. Your Honors, in the real world out there, who are the targets of this deprivation of rights? The law targets an ascertainable group of activists and perceived, dis perceived dissenters who have been victims of red tagging and terrorist tagging by the mere claim that they are suspected persons. Based on the action of respondents and contemporaneous events, these suspected persons generally refer to activists or perceived dissenters who criticize or oppose certain government acts or policies. The victims range from churches, international NGOs such as Caritas or the Swedish Red Cross, universities, opposition legislators, human rights defenders, priests, prominent lawyers, and celebrities who are perceived to be opposing actions of public official who can dish it but cannot take it. Even those who criticize the anti-terror law have become victims of terrorist tagging. Many activists and dissenters, mostly in the provinces, have died while being served by the police with search warrants, many of which were actually issued by judges in Metro Manila on a formulaic narrative of nanlaban. A determination of whether a particular group has been organized for the purpose of engaging in terrorism necessarily involves applying the definition of terrorism to past acts for previous circumstances. Criminalizing membership in designated or proscribed organization likewise amounts to punishment for acts allegedly committed by these organizations or their members prior to the enactment of the law. Section 16 subjects any person to anyone who relates to the suspected person as targets of unrestrained surveillance that allows respondents to collect any private communication using any mode of device on any subject, a clear violation of the constitutional right against unreasonable searches and seizures and the right to privacy. While we consider addressing real teletrate uh, terrorism as a legitimate concern, voiding the terror law that overreaches to quell not just terrorism of motley bands, but the dissent of many and the freedoms of multitude does not render the government helpless against terrorists as there are many laws that can be and are actually being employed against attacks on government and the public. A basic principle valid objective, it is also necessary that the means employed to pursue it 
be in keeping with the Constitution. Mere expediency will not excuse the constitutional shortcut. No one should go to prison for the exercise of constitutional right, and we must do the right thing, Your Honor, for the right reasons in the right way. Thank you very much, Your Honors. Okay. Congressman, Congressman Lagman is recognized. Good afternoon, Your Honor. <clears throat> section 21, no, Section 29 of the APA on a maximum of 24 days detention of alleged suspected terrorists without judicial warrant of arrest, obviously defies more than a century of libertarian tradition enjoyed by Filipinos against unreasonable seizures of their person, dating back to the Malolos Constitution of 1899, the Bill of 1902, the Jones Law of 1916, and the Constitutions of 1935, 1973, and 1987. In stark contrast with the APA, the Malolos Constitution, the first Constitution of the Philippines, and the first Republican Charter in all of Asia, mandated that, quote, all persons detained shall be discharged or delivered to the judicial authority within 24 hours following the act of detention. That was 122 years ago. Now the APA has ominously retrogressed to draconian times. Warrants of arrest are invariably issued solely by a judge. Although during the martial law regime, in addition to, judici to judicial warrants, executive warrants like ASOS, PCOs, and PDAs were issued upon authority of President Marcos and legitimized by the 1973 Constitution. This anomaly was junked by the 1987 Constitution, which deleted the phrase, quote, or such other responsible officer as may be authorized by law, unquote. And it reverted to the 1935 provision on judicial warrants of arrest upon probable cause and added, quote, to be determined personally by the judge, unquote. Now, except for three instances of authorized warrantless arrest under Section 5 of Rule 115 of the Rules of Court, the inflexible rule is that no arrest can be effected legally without a judicial warrant of arrest. Detention upon the unilateral and unbridled authorization of the Unpaid Terrorism Council, which is a purely executive agency, arrogates judicial jurisdiction and resurrects the infamous assos of the martial law of martial law vintage. This executive authorization of prolonged detention is reminiscent of the Spanish Inquisition when persons suspected of heresy and witchcraft were incarcerated for long periods without being charged and tried. They were mercilessly tortured during lengthy custody. Extended detention induces the commission of torture to coerce confession in violation of the Anti-Torture Act of 2009. Long detention without judicial intervention must be prescribed to foreclose the incidence of torture. Section 29 of the ATA violates the Convention Against Torture and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, prohibiting arbitrary arrest or detention to which the Philippines is a state party. It is grossly ironic that when the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, the 1987 constitution mandates 
that the detention of a person shall not exceed three days, within which he shall be judicially charged or otherwise he shall be released. But during normal times under the ATA, extrajudicial detention is a maximum of 24 days. In warrantless arrests, the period of detention is delimited by Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code, the maximum of which is 36 hours. Extrajudicial arrests and detentions without judicial oversight for 24 days are arbitrary, even orchus. Verily, an executive warrant of detention violates the separation of powers. The ATA also unlawfully expands the rule on warrantless arrests, thereby usurping the exclusive rulemaking power of the Supreme Court under Section 5.5 of Article 8 of the Constitution on the court protection and enforcement of constitutional rights, unquote. Prolonged detention denies the suspect's right to be presumed innocent, deprives him of his right to seasonably post bail, derails his right to speedy disposition of his case, divests him of his right to promptly avail of the writs of habeas corpus and amparo, and derogates his right against torture. These constitutional rights presuppose brief pre-trial detention. Even the safeguards for detained suspects under the similarly challenged Human Security Act have been abandoned by the ATA. This blatant transgression of the Constitution should not wait for an actual case to happen, to be struck down, since the constitutional infirmity is patent on the face of Section 29, wherein an executive authorization for detention supplants a judicial warrant of arrest. Mere suspicion takes the place of a prior judicial finding of probable cause. And the 24-day maximum extrajudicial detention is inordinately long and oppressive, all in violation of Section 2 of the Bill of Rights and other fundamental safeguards. Your Honors, the Congress committed grave abuse of discretion in passing the ATA. The multiple odious violations of the Constitution authorized by the ATA evidently manifest the grave abuse of discretion of the Congress in passing this aberration of our legislation. The original scene emanated from the Senate, which forced past the grievously infirm Senate Bill number 1083. Senator Pampilo Lacson, the bill's principal author, justified prolonged detention without judicial warrant of arrest purportedly to foreclose in Kuwait offense or when no crime has yet been committed. This is an unmitigated assault on due process. The House, with censurable alacrity, adopted in total the Senate version, thus precluding the efficacy of a bicameral conference. Its grave abuse was highlighted with the utter denial of extensive debates and abusive rejection of curative amendments. The tyranny of the supermajority railroaded the passage of the copycat House Bill number 6875 in a single session of about four hours from sponsorship to approval on second reading. Consequently, your honors, judicial recourse to the Honorable Supreme Court is the only remedy to redress and relief on behalf of the Filipino people. Thank you, Your Honors. Attorney Latif, please recognize. That is L A T I P H. Assalamu alaikum, Your Honor. May it please the court. Your Honors, the right to self-determination is the right of the people to determine their political status and freely pursue their social, economic, and cultural development. 
this right is not only a treaty obligation, but a customary international law that Moro and indigenous people are entitled to as held in Cotabato versus Republic. Your Honor, the word people is mentioned 36 times in the Constitution in the context of rights conferred and duties imposed to the government. When the Constitution mentioned people, it refers collectively not only to the Filipino people in general, but it is our submission that it also embraces Moro and indigenous people by virtue of the recognition of their identity as people under Bansamoro Organic Law and the Indigenous Peoples' Right Act. Your Honors, the prime duty of the armed forces of the Philippines and the government is to protect the people under Section 3 and 4 of Article 2, respectively, of the Constitution. Further, military must respect people's right in the performance of their duty under Section 5, Paragraph 2, Article 15, while Congress, in legislation, has the duty to protect and enhance the right of the people the right of all the people to human dignity in Section 1, Article 13. And in Section 5, Article 2, it provides that the protection of life, liberty, and property in cognate rights under the Bill of Rights is essential for the enjoyment by all the people. Your Honors, as exhaustively discussed by my colleagues, the law is unconstitutional because it failed to respect and protect the rights and freedom of the people. We stated in our petition that Moro have been victims of historical injustice, massive, massive land grabbing, structural discrimination, and human rights violation through extreme military measures like the case of Marawi Seeds in 2017, Samboaga Seed in 2013, Holo burning dubbed as Holocaust in 1974, all out war policy in 2000, displacing one million people. And the list goes on, Your Honors. Because of these extreme measures, Your Honors, violence has been normalized in our region and produced violent extremist groups. It is very unfortunate that we now have a law that institutionalized extreme measures in the arbitrary curtailment of our freedom and liberty. Your Honors, the Moro and indigenous people have been victims of prejudice in racial profi profiling in law enforcement. Post Asia in 2006, in a nationwide survey revealed that 45% of the respondents perceived that Muslims are terrorists or extremists. And there are two cases this year in Abdullah and Siberiano declaring the outdated stereotyping and blood type prejudice, prejudice upon the moral. Indigenous people have been victims of red tagging and red baiting. They are also victims of human historical injustice, massive land grabbing, structural discrimination, human rights violations have been committed against, the, against them, especially their leaders, mostly in connection with their free and prior informed consent on their ancestral, ancestral domain. In fact, Your Honors, the first to be charged under this assailed law are two ITAS in August 2020. Your Honors, it is ironical that the Assade law securitized our freedom and liberty by making them an existential threat to our way of life. Violent extremists in, an, in attaining their goals, they do not advocate, they do not protest, they do not conduct work stoppage or assert constitutionally protected rights. Your honors, they use extreme violence, not the constitutional protection on Bill of Rights. Your honors, the Assail Law is a statutory response to the violent extremists in Maral Seeds, whose goals, among others, are to deny our freedom in liberty. These goals are coming into fruition with this law that negates our constitutional rights. Our democracy is under siege. This honorable court is the last line of defense in protecting it. Please stand firm, uphold the rights of the people. In the name of freedom, liberty, and love, Your Honors, we petition to nullify this law. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, well, no, no, no other counsel for the petitioners. I think they're already through. So Justice uh, Karandang will first uh, interpolate any of the counsel of the petitioners. Go ahead. 
Any request, uh, Attorney Cadiz, to answer some questions from the court? Apart from the uh, cases mentioned by Attorney Orsu about the uh, freezing of deposits of the religious organization and the ITAS who were charged not petitioners in this case, are the other petitioners or the are the petitioners been have been charged or prosecuted under the law? Your Honor, uh, not of my own knowledge. However, uh, let me call the attention of the Honorable Court to the uh, filing of uh, a pleading by retired Justice Antonio Carpio that uh, threatens uh, the petitioner, Your Honor, through the Facebook account of General Parlade. The Facebook account, Your Honor, still exists. In, if I may get uh, a print of copy. Is it about general? Is it about the red tagging? It's an actual threat, Your Honor. In, and if I may read the okay. posting of uh, General Antonio Parlade. General Antonio Parlade in his Facebook account, which is still exists, Your Honor, says the Supreme Court will soon be hearing petitions against the anti terrorists This is his opening statement. Let's be watchful of these individuals, groups, and organizations opposing a law that will protect our citizens from terrorists. What's their agenda? It's uh, a long posting, Your Honor, but I will now go to his concluding sentences. The day of judgment is upon you. And the Filipino people who have suffered enough from the malignant hands of the CPP, NPA, and NDF, of which you are part of sit in judgment. Very soon, blood debts will be settled. The long arm of the law will catch up on you and your supporters. This is an actual threat, Your Honor. We cannot sit idly by for General Parlade to actualize this threat. So you would say that this is the actual threat to the safety and liberty of some of the petitioners in this case? In fact, Your Honor... How about the other petitioners who have not been uh, charged or prosecuted under the terror law, anti-terror law? Can they maintain their uh, standing to sue in this case? Your Honor... Uh, I will go into that, but General Parlade does not distinguish. He says, Your Honor, let's be watchful of these individuals, groups and organizations opposing a law that will protect our citizens from terrorists. So we take the not integrated part of the Philippines, Your Honor. We take note of that. We take note of that. Yes, uh, and uh, we have many readings about it. So, in effect, you're saying this is a real threat to the safety and life of the petitioners or particular some of the petitioners? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Next question. You are invoking this constitutional duty under the doctrine of the expanded judicial power, alleging that the law gives rise to disputes between co-equal branches of government. Can you enumerate some of these disputes between organs of government to, to put this case into constitutional context? Your Honor, uh, under section, nine, section 29 of the anti-terror law, the ATC has the power to detain persons for 24 days without warrant. It has arrogated upon itself, Your Honor, the power of uh, the judiciary to issue a warrant 
and likewise it trivializes the rules of court on warrantless arrest because in warrantless arrest your honor it uh, only authorizes arrest on uh, matters which uh, the crime uh, has just been committed a crime is about to be committed or a crime is being committed but in this case your honor uh, a warrantless arrest is uh, is being done uh, without so, any evidence your honor it, uh, if i may make it short so it's a class of the executive power versus the judiciary yes your honor is there any other instance wherein the executive in this case encroaches upon a constitutional organ or a constitutional body your honor even congress for that matter it all it is uh, it is also a clash between uh, the legislative uh, branch of government and the executive branch of government because the legislative branch of government has unduly delegated or uh, delegated to the executive branch of government the power to legislate and i think in the true sense even if both houses of congress uh, has uh, delegated uh, the uh, rule making power it is still uh, illegal under the constitution your honor so it's not actually a class it's just an undue delegation of legislative power do i get it right your honor uh, unfortunately the legislative branch of government in this case has uh, um, abstained uh, its power but in the true sense in the constitution your honor it's still a clash between what the legislature can do and what the executive branch can do what the what le the legislature can do and what the executive can do or cannot do yes your honor which is which uh what the executive branch cannot do and what the legislative branch can do, can do. i agree on thank you you are mounting of facial challenge of the law what is the prevailing doctrine on facial challenges of laws like this your honor um a facial challenge can be mounted if there is uh, a question of unconstitutionality of the law and likewise uh, that infringes on the freedom of speech your honor. and your honor since there is already an actual threat of prosecution by uh, the uh, a member a high ranking member of the armed forces of the philippines then uh, a facial challenge is also appropriate of course we are aware of the decision in the case of southern hemisphere yes yeah, sure which held that facial invalidation of a statute is allowed only in free speech cases right yes yeah, sure is there any exception your honor uh southern hemisphere likewise uh, cites holder versus humanitarian law project it says the pre-enforcement review of criminal statute challenged on vagueness grounds since plaintiffs face a credible threat of prosecution in this case your honor there is already a credible, credible threat of prosecution and should not be required to await and are undergo a criminal prosecution as the sole means of seeking relief so uh under the southern hemisphere case your honor decided by this court then a facial challenge is is uh, proper your honor although your honor uh, this uh, topic uh, has been assigned also to uh, attorney shell job this is anyway um, okay. other questions on facial challenges will be will be given by my esteemed colleague justice leon and Thank yes. you, Attorney Cadiz. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Okay. <laughs>
Attorney Molo, can we have you on the Thank floor? Thank you very much, Your Honor. Attorney Molo, are the rich of Amparo and rich of Habeas data available in this in this law? Your Honor, uh, can you? I, I'm excuse sorry. Me, excuse me, Attorney Molo. Can you just, uh, remove your? We, I your think field? we can remove. Yeah, so that yeah. we can hear you. So okay. that thank you. We cannot thank hear you. you. In fact, we were not able to hear you clearly when you were speaking earlier. Are the rich of Amparo and Habeas data available to persons? prosecuted prosecuted or incarcerated or suspected of becoming terrorists under this law thank you for the question your honor nominally they are available as they remain rules issued by the honorable court but as has been alleged by several of the petitions they become illusory under the ata what do you mean nominally uh, they remain effective and therefore they can be available your honor but for example as pointed out in the petition filed by uh, Justice Carpio, even if you have a petition for habeas corpus, all the ATC or the persons in custody of the person needs to show is the written authority of the ATC. And that's that. Tapos na po yung usapan. In fact, the reason why we raised this case essentially as a separation of powers case aside from being a civil liberties case is the fact that the judiciary, although it retains its power under the Constitution, under the ATA, is being diminished directly by the ATA. For example, Your Honor, in bail, in Section 34 of the ATA. No, we're talking of rich and amparo and rich of habeas data. Yes, Your Honor. You mean to say that the judge to whom the authority of the ATC to designate or arrest will just violate the, uh, will just forget about the rights of people and just dismiss the case your well your honor is that your is that your assumption no your mm -hmm. honor of course the judge will uh, prosecute these writs but the preliminary question is when will the judge be available to the person in detention so it's you're now relating it to the immediate nature of judicial course recourse in this case your honor we are delving into the fact that judicial remedy while it is av available still is no longer effective under this law why not effective because the court can resolve the rates as applied for by these people yes your honor uh, we agree it's, it remains law but is the as court, a practical matter sorry is the court will the court just perfunctorily dismiss the case upon the showing that there is an order from the ATC to arrest or detain these people? Your Honor, uh, thank you again for that question. That is not the, okay, uh, it's not the assumption, but rather uh, what we are saying is that, for example, Your Honor, the charge... You can put that in your memorandum, please, no? Uh, yes, so, Because the, the court would like to be clear on the matter. Yes, If Honor. indeed the writ of Amparo is available or the writ of Abayas... Uh, data is available to persons prosecuted under the law and will it be fast or will it be too long before the judicial remedy can be availed of? yes your honor we will do so in our memorandum as okay. Ordered. okay thank you generally the void for vagueness and overbreadth doctrines have been applied when face facial challenges mounted are this the only doctrines that can be used in a facial challenge or are there any other tests on this? Thank Can you, we apply a, another test to challenge facially the constitutionality of the law? Your Honor, thank you. Actually, the facial challenge uh, doctrine emanates from US Constitutional. It is an interesting doctrine because it emanates from a jurisdiction that does not have expanded judicial review. Therefore, when they first created this mechanism, it was intentionally to allow litigants to have judicial review, even if there is no as applied facts, no actual case. 
by nature, it is hypothetical. And therefore, Your Honor, in answer to your question, a good situation is precisely the second dimension of this case. The separation powers dimension, separation of powers dimension of this case. Where, are, you, are, you aware, are you aware of the strict scrutiny test? Yes, Your Honor. Will I this can, apply in this case? It does apply, Your Honor. How will it how will this how will it apply in this case? Your Honor, strict scrutiny requires that whenever there is a clash between a legislative act or a governmental act that affects or abridges fundamental rights strict scrutiny or the highest scrutiny found in constitutional litigation must apply. It has two elements. First, that there is an abridgment of the fundamental right, and it is this abridgment is based on a compelling state interest, not just legitimate, compelling state interest. The second prong is the requirement that this compelling state interest is effective, is effective by means that are narrowly tailored, meaning, Your Honors, not just as a theoretical or academic matter, it, it is the burden of government in strict scrutiny. The burden shifts, the burden becomes the burden of government to prove that out of all possibilities, this is the only way to achieve the legitimate, the compelling state interest. In the context of the ATA, Your Honor, the compelling state interest, or the legitimate state interest, would be terrorism, as alleged by the Office of the Solicitor General, which we will disagree because we disagree with the characterization of compelling disability uh, legitimate. However, we also disagree with the second prong, which is narrowly, ta narrowly tailored. Your Honors, it is not narrowly tailored. Why? To begin with, in order to prove narrow tailoring, you need to identify actual, practical, real efforts to show that this is the least inclusive of rights. To begin with, Your Honor, there is okay. one undeniable uh, fact. We, are, we have now the overview. We can, you can expound it in the memorandum that the yes, court will require you. Next. You also assail the creation of the Anti-Terrorism Council and its function. If the provisions on the ATC is, are struck down, should, should we cut down the entire law? Uh, Your Honor, it is our position that the narrative being propounded by government that this country will re become helpless against terrorism if this law is struck down is not true. The ATA repealed the HSA, the Human Security Act. It is a law that was effective for several years. It may not have been the best, but it protected this country by virtue of law. Even if this court strikes down the ATA, by virtue of law, the repealing provision will revive the HSA. And this court has ruled in previous cases that that is possible. Therefore, the anti-terrorism infrastructure will still consist of A, the Human Security Act, the, the Enhanced Anti-Terrorism Financing Act, and the just recently signed two days ago, the expanded Anti-Money Laundering Act. The ATC will survive because under the HSA, the Human Security Act, the AT still, ATC is still there. The only thing, the only thing that will be gone will be this odious provision in Section 29. That provision that has the title, Detention Without Judicial Warrant of Arrest. How about Section 55, the separability clause? Thank you, Your Honor. The separability clause of ATA actually says these provisions shall remain in place regardless of the nullity of others as they may be affected thereby. The separability clause of the ATA itself says that if the provisions that are nullified would relate to the other provisions and are proved to be mutually dependent and interconnected, such that the legislature is presumed not to have intended for this law to operate as a whole, then the nullity of the key provisions will lead to the nullity of the other provisions by virtue of the same separability clause, Your Honor. Or, if not there, under Tata versus Secretary of Energy. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, Your Honor. 
assuming that the law is declared unconstitutional, will the Human Security Act be resurrected? Yes, Your Honor, because this is a direct express repeal of the uh, Human Security Act. And under previous decisions of this honorable court, Your Honor, there were instances when there was a direct express repeal. The repeal of the repealing law operated to revive. But we can so elaborate more, Your Honor, in our memorandum okay. as to those decisions. Thank you, Attorney Molo. Thank you, Your Honor. You have enlightened us on so many points. Thank you, Your Honor. Can we have now Attorney Jokna to have the floor? It is a settled doctrine that Congress has the plenary power to legislate subject to several constitutional limitations such as the due process clause. You are assailing section four of the act for being violative of your right to due process. Which provision of this law is so unclear and ambiguous? Section four, if you're on it, please, contains the definition of terrorism. It is our submission that that definition violates um, overbreadth, um, void for vagueness, and as well the strict scrutiny test. We, we submit, Your Honor, that the strict scrutiny test applies in this case because this uh, law regulates speech based on its content. We are referring to Section 4 in relation to Section 9, Sections 5, 6, and 8, and 10 as well of the anti-terror law. When the, we have already the IRR, and the IRR says the law punishes conduct coupled with nature and intent. Is Your that Honor, not a curative thing that will explain at least the big ambiguity in the law? If that were inside the law itself, it may, Your Honor. However, if the fact that it is only in the IRR and not in the law itself, cannot cure. Can you read the law? The law, I think, is acts, nature, and content. No, Context. Sir. Is that not included in the law? The acts law. plus nature and context. The law, if you're on it, please, refers to specific acts intended to. But the law also mentions nature and context. Nature. Yes. I exactly. think the, the, law, the law mentioned that. In relation it's not, to the purposes, uh, Your Honor, that is correct. Okay, can 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 you can you make it clearer that the IRR did not explain the ambiguity in the law? Well, we submit that that statement in the IRR that the law explain only analyzes it in, conduct explain, and not speech is uh, in error, if Your Honor, please. Okay. The so law itself clearly penalizes and restricts speech based on its content. That is found in Section 9, inciting to terrorism, Sections 5, 6, 8, and 10 on training, um, etc. Based on Section 4, advocacy, protest, dissent, stoppage of work, industrial or mass action, and other similar exercises of civil and political rights, if not intended to cause death, blah, 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 are not punishable. Does this fall under the definition of protected speech? That is precisely the problem, Your Honor. It has a qualifia that the exercise of these rights is not terrorism if it is not intended. And one of the problems with that, if Your Honor, please, is we will leave it to the law enforcer to decide whether these exercises of rights have the requisite intent. Now, if Your Honor, please, the intent that we found in the anti-terror law is not the specific intent found in the revised penal code okay. because this is a special law. We are only referring to general intent, which is uh, supposed, according to jurisprudence, presumed from the acts. So in oh. other words, any law enforcer could presume the intent of a person exercising his rights and say that uh, that is intended to endanger person's lives, etc., and therefore qualifies as uh, terrorism. Further, Attorney uh, Jokna, how do you consider this law? Is it a malum prohibitum or a malay in law? 
Well, it is a special law, if you're on a place. It is not a revised penal code law. In that sense, it is a malum prohibitive. So it's a malum prohibitive as far as you're concerned. Yes, Your Honor. Unlike, okay. if I may point out, unlike the Human Security Act, which expressly incorporated Book One of the Revised Penal Code, the anti-terror law does not mention at all the Revised Penal Code. Who bears the burden of showing presence and absence of intent? Is it not the government? According well, to the according to the law and to the rules. Yes, Your Honor, but the, the problem with this particular law is the fact that it includes in its definition exercise of civil and political rights depending on the intent. Who will now decide whether that intent is present? Initially, it will be the arresting officer. Later on, it will be the prosecutor, and later on, it will be the judge. So However, if I may, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Okay. The, the, we would have no problem if the law required a predicate crime or criminal acts. However, the law does not. It did away with the requirement of predicate crime found in the Human Security Act. And therefore, intent may now be presumed from innocent, legitimate, non-criminal acts. And that is our concern here on it. Okay. If the government is able to prove such intent to cause damage, so and so, do you not agree that the act can be punished as terrorism? We would have the. We would remember it's the government who will prove intent to cause damage, bodily injury, damage to critical in, critical infrastructure. Can it not be punished as an act of terrorism, falling under one, two, three, four? Precisely, Your Honor, the fact that that intent is simply presumed from acts that are non-criminal. Uh, means that the law is, covers protected speech and conduct. As I mentioned in my opening statement, conduct, for example, that would be reminiscent. Is it hard to the, prove intent? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Is it hard to prove intent? Well, criminal if, intent? If is you're it hard to of prove? General intent found in the special law? No, Your Honor, because that is presumed from the acts. Generally, that would be presumed from a criminal act. But so, in this case, the acts are not criminal. Since, according to you, it's volum prohibitum, the act, there is presumption of intent by committing the act? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. You are aware of the case of Brandenburg versus Ohio? Yes, Your Honor. The Supreme Court held that the state cannot forbid political speech that seems to advocate overthrowing the government unless it is both directed at inciting such action and is likely to actually incite it. In line with this test, consider this example. A social media influencer tweets to his one million followers that they must overthrow the current government by bombing Malacanang. However, this influencer did not actually commit any act. Can this statement be punished under Section 9 for inciting to terrorism? The problem with Section 9 of the law, Your Honor, is that it does not incorporate the requirements of Brandenburg. The Brandenburg decision requires two elements for there to be a punishable advocacy. That the language is directed at inciting imminent lawless action and that it is likely to do so. That is not found in the law, if Your Honor, please. While there was an attempt by the implementing rules to include that, that is an essential element that should only be made by Congress and not within the province of the Anti-Terror Council. To so you will explain to us that the requirements of the Brandenburg versus Ohio case are not met? Yes, Your Honor. Since the petitioners argue that Section 9 of the of the ATA is unconstitutional for creating a chilling effect as regards the right to free speech and expression. However, there are several provisions in the revised penal code punishing inciting to commit certain acts, like 138 and 142. How do you differ this section nine from the provisions of the revised penal code? 
I believe Your Honor is referring to the provisions on inciting to sedition. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, look, the, the purposes found in the elements of inciting to sedition are different from the elements of inciting to terrorism. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. In fact, in the case of Escuelas, uh, there was a dissent by one of the justices in that case. What would be the difference? Well, the sedition is really removing of allegiance, uh, resistance to state authority. That is my understanding of that crime, Your Honor, please. And so far as terrorism is concerned, um, we are unsure ourselves of what, um, given the nebulous definition, it is really targeting. Thank you, Attorney Jock. Thank you. Pwede bang tawagan ulit natin si Attorney Molo? Parang may naiwan akong question sa kanya. <laughs> Gusto ba nating tapusin, Chief, ngayong araw na to? My questions will be finished in another hour. No. Would you know that membership, if membership in a terrorist, terrorist organization is punishable in other jurisdictions, Attorney Molo? Your Honor, I am not an expert on the law of other jurisdictions. However, I can elaborate on membership under this law and in relation to how this honorable court treated membership in previous similar laws, if, if that is okay. I would refer to the time, Your Honor, when this honorable court was faced with a similar proposition from government, subversion. We were told at that time that this law is necessary for national security. And this honorable court ruled in People versus Ferrer that the Subversion Act is fine, even if it punishes membership. However, under People versus Ferrer, Justice Castro pointed out that the elements of knowingly, intentionally, and through overt acts were present in the Subversion Law. They are not present in Section 10 uh -huh. under the ATA. Further, in People versus Ferrer, it was the Supreme Court, the Honorable Court, further clarified that this law, the Subversion Act, would be a bill of attainder. It would be an ex post facto law unless it be canalized by, by putting in that it is not just membership knowing, but rather knowing that is adherence to the organization's objectives. The membership must be active. It must not just be nominal or passive or inactive. There must be specific intent to further the goals of the organization, which should be showed by overt acts. And just discussed, uh, Justice Tihanke, in his uh, additional opinion, also added that there must be evidence that there is direct participation in unlawful activities. And here's the cut. After all of these five requirements, all of these must be done after the Anti-Subversion Act was passed. Under the ATA, none of these are available. What's more, what's worse, the operative act that turns a previously valid organization, for example, your honors, I'm a member, I think, of the Pai Gamma Mu Society of UP. I don't know what they're doing, but just in case they're designated, under people versus Ferrer. Pai Gamma Mu? Yes, Your Honor. That's an honor society. How can that be? Is that not is that not an honor society? Yes, Your Honor. How can that be considered as a terrorist organization? I am not aware of what they are up to right now, Your Honor. <laughs> but since they are in UP, I and the UP has already been described as a hotbed terrorist. Is that not speculative? No, Your Honor, because it's a facial member. Member, din ako noon. Tao gama pi ah pau. Oh, what's I'm that? Happily in good company, Anong, Your Honor. Ano yan? I I forgot. Pai gama new. The Honor Society of the yes. AS? Pai Kappa Pai. The other one? Uh, Pai Kappa Pai, Mo? Pai Gamma Mu din daw po, Your Honor. Ano, ano? Pai Gamma Mu din daw po, Your Honor. That is the Honor Society of the of University? AS. Oh, yes, Your Honor. You're a member of that? Yes, your, I think so, Your Honor, because they sent me a certificate when I was in my undergrad. <laughs> but, Your Honor, going back to the, to, to the question of the Honorable Court, 
yes, it is hypothetical, but it is precisely because this is a facial challenge. By nature, we are talking about the text, not an as-applied challenge. In any event, Your Honor, I don't know what they're doing, but according to Justice Duhanti's dissent and concurring in People versus Ferrer, which I believe through history has been proven to be the better side of People versus Ferrer, along with Chief Justice Fernando, who also dissented, all of these must happen after the Subversion Act was passed. Because if you allow it to operate in such a way that what your past conduct did, I, I ergo joining that society, and therefore now suddenly because somebody in a secret chamber where you were never present, never allowed to present evidence. So no in effect, what, remedy, what, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say, Your Honor, that mere membership, both Should abroad not be. under these provisions and under the honorable court's doctrines cannot should not, be punished. Should not be punishable. No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. I think uh, that is the only question left unanswered. Uh, can we have uh, Congressman Colmenares? Yeah. Pero Congressman pa rin yan, maski noon at saka ngayon. Di ba? <laughs> good, good afternoon po, Your Honor. Petitioners claim that Section 16 of the Anti-Terrorism Act violates the right to privacy. According to Article 3 of Section 3 of the Constitution, the privacy of communication and correspondence shall be inviolable except upon lawful order of the court or when public safety or order requires otherwise as prescribed by law. Don't you think that counter-terrorism activities fall under the exception of public safety or order and thus allow a legitimate intrusion in a person's privacy? Yeah. Your Honor, please. We have to go back again to the definition of can, terrorism. Can you make it louder, law. please? Yes. The definition of terrorism allows an unbridled uh, expression on the part of the military or the ATC, for that matter, Your Honor, to uh, access record or uh, collect information, even private information, Your Honor. Imagine, Your Honor, the uh, order of the uh, court in this case, Your Honor, under Section 16, would not even describe with certainty the uh, the things or places to be searched under our the constitution your your honors please a surveillance such as this is tantamount to a search and under the constitution a search to be reasonable in must fact, have probable cause and must describe the things or place to be searched but, in this case your honor is unbridled but you, we must understand the order of surveillance must be authorized by the Court of Appeals upon application, right? Yes, Your Honor. So there are safeguards. In no, fact, Your Honor, uh, in fact, the, the, the test is probable cause before the Court of Appeals could issue an order of surveillance. In fact, Your Honor, it's an ex parte application. And the basis of probable cause of the uh, Court of Appeals is, for example, Remember that an offense has been committed. So you are you are against the ex parte application. Well, Your Honor, I'm just saying this that the standard. Para di ba ganon din ang search warrant? It's for, an ex parte application. Yes, Your Honor. The relevance of ex parte is this, Your Honor, please, that the the basis of the court to issue the the authorization is a, an offense has been committed. And the uh, effects of the crime can be found in the place to be searched. How can the court know that an offense has been or is about to be committed? In fact, Your Honor, the, uh, the, the definition would not give the court standards on what probable cause is. Because nobody really knows what the crime being committed or is about to be committed is done, Your Honor, please. So in that sense, the court authorization actually is without probable cause in the sense that the, the court uh, has no uh, standards to follow with which to issue the what the, the, the what are the standards to follow mm -hmm. attorney or uh, uh, congressman pardon what are the standards that uh, need to be followed 
Well, probable cause is not enough before well, a court of appeals can issue the order of surveillance. Well, what could be your standards? In terms of search, Your Honor, the probable cause would be that an offense uh, has been committed. And then, of course, the, the effects of that offense can be found in the place to be searched. In this case, Your Honor, it penalizes intention. So how would the court know that an offense uh, you know, it, it is, has been committed, Your Honor? And so in that sense, Your Honor speaks, the probable cause of the judge is based on the allegations of the uh, respondents here in this case, Your Honor. Okay. And uh, yes, Your Honor. Don't you think that terrorism is a very, very grave crime against national security and even a crime against the pe people's security and life? That before they actually have to do any terroristic act, the, 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 the state has the right to know the information beforehand through a surveillance ordered by the Court of Appeals? Well, Your Honor, yes, we recognize the fact that uh, terrorism is a grave and serious concern, Your Honor. However, the court has mentioned so many decisions that uh, it's not a question of expediency, that interest must be, compelling state interest even, must be narrowed down, tailored narrowly by, by the it's, law. It's and the any, any important compelling interest, if the respondents wishes to do that, must be uh, in consonance with the constitution, Your Honor. So uh, even if they claim yes, it's uh, it's you know it's very important. It cannot be said, Your Honor, that it, it because it's important, it's a serious concern. The fundamental rights of others can be violated because of the state interest at hand, Your Honor. The court will surely strike down a law that uh, just because using the, the the concern or the the gravity of the crime will violate fundamental rights, Your Honors. Can you honestly believe that the prevention of the commission of a terroristic act can be properly done without surveillance and interception? Well, Honor, thank you, Your Honor. Actually, I think the prevention of uh, terrorism need not be through a law like the ATA, which is unnecessarily sweeping as to infringe on protected rights, Your Honors. Uh, surveillance, uh, in fact, uh, can be done by state and it's in the constitution, it's in the, it's all in the law. However, in this case, Your Honor, an unbridled discretion, uh, in, you know, any mode, any personal information, using any mode against any person, Your Honor, uh, is really too much of a power given to the ATC, Your Honor. It violates not only unreasonable uh, searches and seizures, but also the right to privacy. And uh, even if it is important to catch a criminal, whether terrorist or not, that surveillance must be done, the Constitution requires that basic rights must be followed, basic steps must be followed. Uh, you, you see, Your Honor, surveillance, if we connote it as a, as a search, the presumption against a search is that it, it, you know, it's for the part of government to prove that the search is necessary. Can you That's not just what, consider this as a matter of evidence that uh, if properly excluded, the court can exclude? Well, in this case, Your Honor, because of the vagueness and overbreath of the law, the court doesn't even know whether the, the things or uh, uh, effects that were seized are part because, you see, it didn't even describe uh, the things to be seen. Under the surveillance of provision, in section 16, there is no plain view, Your Honor. There's the moment no? there is no plain view in the sense that uh, the moment you're surveilled, all information is quote, quote unquote plain view in the sense that it can be uh, taken by the ATC, Your Honor, even of personal information that is not in any way related to the offense can still be collected and reported by the ATC, Your Honor. So uh, in that sense, uh, we, we, we contend that uh, the, we understand the concern for terrorism, but it must not be to the detriment and violation of fundamental Is rights. the probable cause standard not enough safeguard? Well, the, the mention of probable cause seems to portray that there is probable cause. For example, Your Honor, a ATC goes to, to the court and says, well, we have a probable cause that an offense is being committed, for example. 
and that the things to be seen yeah. in that but the probable cause must be established at least then the eyes cause, of the judge issuing the order hindi lang there is a probable cause that the act was committed yes, there so must the be judge, something behind that yes so the judge will now ask what offense has been committed so are oh. you not comfortable that the court of appeals will issue the order and on, on on a probable cause No, it can't in that sense, Your Honor, because the Court of Appeals will say, so what offense has been committed? Oh, it's an act that was intended. It's an intention, Your Honor. Can you, it, provide, can you provide a safe standard, an acceptable and reasonable standard? Uh, for us, Your Honor, the, the Section 4 actually cannot be cured by any reasonable standard. Ah, okay. So Section 4 cannot be cured by any reasonable no, standard. Even an IRR cannot be The cured. definition of the acts there cannot be cured by any possible reasonable standard. Especially in an IRR, Your Honor, because the IRR can go behind the law. And IRRs can be changed anyway, while the law cannot be changed. So it is... Not for the IRR to provide a safe standard, Your Honor, because IRRs are just not the laws that Congress has passed. So even if the IRR tried to cure, you know, the law does not require it. So therefore, the, the ATC can always say, well, it's not in the law. And anyway, if you want the IRR, you know, it can okay, be... Okay, Attorney Permanayas, let's go to another point. Thank you. Um, we go to pre- proscription. Proscription, Your Honor. Proscription of terrorist organization. Yes. Is that a, is that a matter assigned to you? Pardon, Your Honor. Huh? I did it here. Is the Your subject Honor. matter assigned to you? Uh, well, it, only as far as bill of attainder and ex post facto law, Your Honor. I think. So, you know, uh, because you did, you divided the uh, the law into several issues. Attorney or so, why your honor is on. okay. Attorney or so will be able to answer the questions on proscription. Attorney Gomez, thank you. In fact, si attorney or so, ang next. Thank you, your honor. Attorney or so, yeah. Designation and proscription, the attorney. Ano ba ang effects ng preliminary proscription order by the Court of Appeals? Your Honor, under uh, Section 35. Section? Uh, under Section 35 of the ATA, the, court, the ALC can uh, either examine the, the accounts, the bank accounts or investments of the person uh, uh, prescribed, whether... Preliminarily, that is, or freeze the assets, Your Honor. So it's, in, even, re- so it's in relation to the power of the AMLA? Yes, Your Honor, among other, other things. can also lead to arrest, detention of the person, as well as prosecution. However, let me point out, Your Honor, that the, uh, the prescription under uh, Section 26 is not required for there to be examination of deposits or investments or freezing of accounts. Okay. Is there a difference between the procedure in obtaining surveillance order under Section 16 and a procedure for obtaining preliminary order of prescription under Section 27? Well, Your Honor, uh, under Section 26, the uh, prescription there, uh, it says that the Court of Appeals uh, will give the person uh, being prescribed or the organization or group of persons being prescribed Uh, notice and hearing, Your Honor. Uh, this is on the basis of the application uh, issued by the... Uh, Are you talking of uh, preliminary or permanent? Your Honor, this is uh, either preliminary or permanent, Your Honor. So, preliminary prescription order is, is, is not a part this, this is rather for after preliminary order of prescription. This is towards uh, permanent prescription, Your Honor. So, as far as your, your, you know, under the law, Your Honor, uh, is the uh, issuance of preliminary order of prescription ex parte or by hearing? Your Honor, it is ex parte, Your ex Honor. Ex parte? Yes, Your Honor. In the same manner as a surveillance order is ex parte? Yes, Your Honor. 
Let's go now to the case of your client whose account has been frozen for the longest time. Your Honor, the RMP is not my client. Uh, the RMP is a petitioner in, uh, I believe, Pabilio versus Duterte, Your Honor. GR number 252767. No, we're talking about the frozen bank deposit of your client, which you mentioned earlier when you were delivering correct, your argument. Your huh? That is correct, Your Honor. But uh, it concerns the bank accounts of the RMP. And the RMP is not a petitioner in my own petition. Yes. It is a petitioner in another petition before the court. It is a, the RMP is a petitioner in GR number 252767, Your Honor. And the counsel there is different, Your Honor. Well, what I will ask you is this. Are the remedies under the uh, AMLAC, AMLAC law? Yes, Your Honor. Not available? to the petitioner so that they can secure the freezing or lifting of the freeze order from the Court of Appeals? Well, the problem, Your Honor, based on uh, what I know about what happened to the RMP bank accounts is that they didn't know about the, uh, they didn't know about the reasons for the freezing. Up, up, upon, the, upon knowing that their accounts were frozen, they did, not, did they not apply with the Court of Appeals to unfreeze the account? Your Honor, the problem is they received the notice of the freezing more than 20 days later. And under the law, they can only file a petition to question the freezing of the accounts within 20 days, I believe. And for that reason, they could not anymore file a petition to because? question the basis of the freezing. Because? Your Honor, because the period provided by the law has had lapsed by the time that they knew. Is it, is it not the knowledge that their accounts were frozen? Well, Your Honor, if the court would like to verify the did they try? Did they try to file a lifting order? Th that's precisely what I'm explaining about, Your Honor. The RMP learned of the freezing. They were given notice of the freezing more than 20 days after uh, the freezing. And since under Section 11 of uh, RA uh, 101, 67. I'm referring, Your Honor, to the law on uh, the crime of financing, financing terrorism. terrorism. Uh, I believe there's a period of 20 days to file that petition to question the freezing. And by the time that they received the notice of the freezing, the, the period had already lapsed. And uh, thereafter, Your Honor, they learned of the reasons for the freezing only nine months later. Your clients did not attempt to go to the Court of Appeals. I was told, Your Honor, they're not, they were, they're not my client, Your Honor. I was told that oh, okay. they decided not to go to the Court of Appeals anymore because they, the period had already lapsed. That is the thinking. They have not tried whether the judicial remedy is available or not. They have not tried whether the judicial remedy is available or not. Well, I could not speak for them, Your Honor, okay. regarding thank you, the, thank you. that particular decision. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, is the freezing under the law forever beyond six months? Well, Your Honor, if you read uh, Section 36. Because under the AMLAC law, freezing is only for a, for a period of six months. So under, is the freezing under this law forever? Until lifted? Effectively, Your Honor, it appears that it could be indefinite. If you refer to, sec to paragraph 3 of section 36 of the ATA, uh, it says that the AMLC uh, could uh, freeze the funds or the accounts uh, until the basis for the issuance thereof shall have been lifted. Okay, and so let's, let's go to another point. So you are pointing now, section? Section 36, third paragraph, Your Honor. There is no period given okay. uh, to limit the, the, the effectivity of, of the freeze order. Let's go to designation. What are the effects of designation of an individual or an organization as a terrorist or a terrorist 
terrorist organization. We honor the person. Uh, the consequences. Yes, the person could be arrested, person could be detained. Uh, the person, of course, could be prosecuted, but that is not uh, a certainty. Uh, the person's uh, assets could be frozen, as I mentioned earlier. Are these functions judicial or executive? Your Honor, they should be considered as judicial functions. They should be considered as Yes, Your Honor. Why? Because, Your Honor, uh, it involves a, uh, an interpretation of the law. It involves a factual determination based on the interpretation of the law. Can and it be, finally, it involves an adjudication on rights and obligations. Can we not liken it to a judgment of the prosecutor, which is an executive function? No, Your Honor. The prosecutor only makes a finding of probable cause for the purpose of filing an information. Prosecutor does not order the arrest of the person. The court will have to order the arrest of the person. Okay. Prosecutor you. cannot arrest. Prosecutor cannot detain. Prosecutor cannot uh, freeze assets, Your Honor. In this particular case, the ATC have, has the absolute power to do so. Under Section 25 of the Anti-Terrorism Act, the Council is mandated to adopt the United Security Council Resolution Consolidated List pursuant to a state obligation of the Philippines. Do you and excuse me? <coughs> do they create binding obligations on the part of the Philippines? This UN Security Council resolution, Your Honor. In so far as uh, the Philippines is a member of the United Nations, yes, the, the Philippines has obligations under the uh, UN Security Council uh, resolutions in relation to its treaty obligations. So we cannot uh, renege on that obligation? Well, unless, Your Honor, we, we want to be considered as uh, not compliant. So what's obligation. the beef on it that uh, the Philippines is adopting the consolidated list given by the United Nations Security Council? Your Honor, the UN Security Council resolution, uh, particularly 1373, as mentioned here in Section 25, does not require states to adopt the consolidated list. Uh, so there is no obligation to adopt the list, Your Honor. In fact, the, uh, the UN Security Council resolutions do not throw out human rights, do not uh, throw out international human rights obligations on the part of states. And in, in many, many documents, including documents of the OACHR, Your Honor, states are reminded that human rights must be respected, protected, and promoted in the course of fighting against terrorism. So you know, the petitioners are in the position that the Philippines is not bound to adopt the list provided by the UN Security Council. That is uh, that is correct, Your Honor. We the, the Philippines, of course, is uh, encouraged to cooperate in the fight against terrorism, and the uh, the Philippines is uh, directed to uh, take measures to combat terrorism. But it does not mean that the Philippines will. Uh, violate human rights or constitutional safeguards uh, to protect the rights of persons. Um, under Section 25, you are questioning, you know, you are impugning the provision on the lack of due process to designate a person or organization as a terrorist organization. There yes, is a honor. process of the listing and pub, uh, of, of publication and thereafter the listing. Is that not enough? Your Honor, the process, uh, the process for the listing is not found in the law. It is only found in the implementing rules and regulations. This is uh, what I referred to earlier, Your Honor, as supplementing uh, the, the, the law, which is not allowed under jurisprudence. So it's an invalid delegation of, uh, of legislative Sorry. powers, Your Honor. So you are in the you are for the position that the listing cannot be done. Your Honor, the ATC of course made the list, but to say that the listing is a remedy that is in the law, I think that is incorrect because the law does not provide for any remedy. As pointed out earlier, Your Honor, the IRR can be ignored by the ATC. The ATC can refer to the law and say there's no delisting. Stated in the A2A, and so we'll ignore 
the IRR because it's actually contrary to what the law says. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Can we have uh, Congressman Lagman? Is he still around? Sir, magandang gabi po. Gabi na ba? Ay, hapong pa para. Congressman, does the word terrorism appear in our constitution? The many constitutions that we adopted from 1935 to 1972 to 1987? I, Your Honor, I am not aware. You're not aware. We are not aware too. So you're not aware also when the word terrorism or crime of terrorism became a part of our statute book? Well, Your Honor, uh, in the case of the Human Security Act ah. of uh, uh, 2007, terrorism there has been defined. And then uh, it refers to the Commission of Predicate Crimes, which uh, provision has not been uh, uh, ETA. So our consciousness or our mind was only open to the to the word terrorism or terroristic act when the Human Security Act was passed? Well, I am not certain, Your Honor, if there were antecedent legislation covering uh, uh, terrorism. It's possible that under the AMLA, uh, terrorism was also mentioned and uh, other uh, laws concerning uh, financing of terrorism, but I am not certain about that, and I can discuss that, uh, your, uh, your Honor, in the memorandum. I okay, thank you. So we go to a specific Article 7, Section 18 of our Constitution, and this is the uh, provision on habeas corpus, which only allow a detention for not more than three days, right, uh, Congressman? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, under uh, that particular uh, provision of the Constitution, even during the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, no person can be detained for more than three days. Okay. Otherwise, he should be uh, released or be brought to the judicial authority. Uh, are we safe to say that since terrorism was not in the mind yet, or not a crime punishable when the 1970, when the 1987 constitution was passed, would, can it not be said that this article on a three-day detention on Habe does not strictly apply to acts of terrorism? Uh, we could not uh, subscribe to that, Your Honor, because the provision of the Constitution uh, is omnibus. Is? Omnibus. It would cover all possible crimes. Even martial law? During martial law. Even, even, uh, during the, even, even covering the proclamation of martial law, detention cannot go beyond three days yes your honor particularly so when uh, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus is a component of the declaration of martial law so it's your position that uh, the three-day limitation on detention still covers acts of terrorism although terrorism was not a word was not a crime that was punished when the 1987 constitution was passed. Yes, Your Honor, because uh, that provision should have uh, a prospective application. 
that would cover acts of tourism. My last question, mga congressman, is like this. Since terrorism is a new phenomenon, drastic attack involving the security of the nation, endangering lives and liberties of people and properties as well, cannot Congress legislate longer period of detention more than what is uh, longer than what is prescribed under rule i under article 125 of the revised penal code uh, your honor congress cannot derogate the protection on civil liberties and other fundamental freedoms. In the, the enactment of the ATA, Congress has put uh, the... Sir, nawala po kayo. Hindi namin kayo narinig. <laughs> Just... Paano? <laughs> Uh, can I, can I, I am clear now, Your Honor? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, uh, as I was saying, uh, Congress cannot pass a law against terrorism by derogating civil and political rights, safeguarded in the Constitution, Your Honor. But in the case of the ATA, it has put the war against terrorism in a pedestal while it has demoted civil liberties to a footstool which to should have it demoted should have been done. Ano po? it was it has demoted the protection of civil liberties to a footstool stone okay parang inaapakan na lang parang inaapakan na lang po inaapakan na po footstool parang inaapakan na lang po yes your honor <laughs> Sige. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Congressman Lagman. Thank you, Your Honor. We appreciate your uh, counsels for the petitioners. We appreciate your answers, candid answers to my interpolations. I give the floor to the other members of the court. Uh, Justice, uh, the Senior Associate Justice, Bernadette, is next. Yeah. Go ahead. Can, can I call attorney to off now, please? <clears throat> Uh, Attorney John, would you know if the definition of terrorism under Section 4 is a novel creation of Congress or if it was just patterned on or inspired by the existing international instruments? The Solicitor General claims that it was patterned after international standards, Your Honor citing the proposed convention on the terrorism that was initially submitted by India to the United Nations in 1996. However, Your Honor, when we compared the provisions of that proposed convention with the law itself here, there are significant differences. First, the convention mentions acts that cause death, damage to property, and so forth. That's not include the term intended to. In other words, it requires actual death, actual destruction, and so forth. Second, Your Honor, the convention only has two purposes. Uh, to compel the government to do or refrain from doing an act, and I believe to spread fear. It does not contain the other purposes that are found in our law. Okay, I'll, I'll flash to you uh, certain experts from various international instruments, such as the UN Security Council Resolution 1566. It's over there, the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorist Bombings and the International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. Okay, as you can see, all of these instruments have semblance of similarity with our definition of terrorism, in that terrorism is generally characterized um, as acts intended to cause serious death or serious bodily injury or cause extensive damage to property. 
if I may ask you the first slide, yes, um, as appearing in the slide, if you're on at least the UN Security Council Resolution 1556, the first two criminal acts intended to cause. You know, so there is that term criminal acts, but which we do not find in RA1147. Our understanding as well, the European Union Directive of 2017 uh, slash 541 also makes reference to either predicate crimes or criminal Pwede acts, which are not found Pwede in our law. All right, so the lack of reference uh, to predicate crimes is what you are questioning that is in the definition of, of terrorism. Yes, Your Honor, I'm sorry. That is one of the concerns we have as well, the, the term critical infrastructure because it can be used to suppress um, acts of um, exercise of civil and political rights that to us are constitutionally protected. All right. So when Congress enacts a penal statute, does it define every word or term in the enactment? Not necessarily, Your Honor. And there's no positive statutory or constitutional command requiring Congress to really um, define every word or term? Not every word, Your Honor. However, the operative words that give rise to the essential elements of the crime made by Congress, we believe, must be understood. And in the anti-terror law, the use of, for example, the inclusion of the term exercise of civil and political rights, which is not intended, um, that in itself gives rise to a lot of confusion. All right. Would you agree with this statement? A statute which is generally worded is not necessarily void for vagueness for as long as the legislative will is clear, or at least the intent can be gathered from the law through the principles of statutory construction. Yes, Your Honor. In fact, I recall uh, Your Honor's uh, ponentia in the Spark case, where I believe that was um, the conclusion that you arrived at. Uh, however, in this particular case, we do submit that the law here uh, fails the vagueness requirements of completeness and uh, sufficient standards. So, that what is the limitation of the court's power to interpret um, ambiguous laws? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm, I'm afraid I didn't get the question. What are the limitations to the court's power to interpret laws? Well, as far as interpretation of the laws is concerned, Your Honor, the, the, the court has um, a lot of discretion in terms of applying rules of construction and interpretation. The only thing it cannot do is substitute its um, uh, judgment for what is what Congress has put into the law. So for as long as the legislative will is clear, the court can interpret yes, uh, laws. Now let's go to the crime of inciting to commit terrorism. Are you, is this assigned to you? Yes, Your Honor. All right. No, um, the IRR provided for factors to consider in determining the existence of reasonable prob probability that the speeches would help ensure success in inciting the commission of terrorism. And I'm sure you know this, what the, these factors are. Now, can you say now that the supposed violation against freedom of expression has already been addressed by these clarifications? We respectfully submit, Your Honor, that that is ultra virus on the part of the Anti-Terror Council because that is part of the essential elements of the law. And only Congress can legislate what the law should uh, contain as far as the essential elements are concerned. So we you would answer... Uh, I'm sorry, yes. So you would answer the same thing with respect to academic freedom? In so far as uh, the IRR is concerned? Yes. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, are you also familiar with material support? Uh, yes, Your Honor. It's not one of my issues, but I am okay. familiar with it. Now, Section 6 of the Anti-Terrorism Act punishes the acts of planning, training, preparing, and facilitating the commission of terrorism. On the other hand, Section 12 of the same law penalizes the act of providing material support to terrorists. Yes. Now, assuming that a person comes up with a plan to bomb a critical government infrastructure, provides the funds for the weaponry of armed militants who are tasked to, uh, to execute the attack, and the plan is um, later accomplished, can this person be both punished under Section 6 by facilitating terrorism and Section 12 by providing material support? Yes, Do you I think do. there's an overlap? 
I believe there would be an overlap. That person could also be charged with the violation of Section 4 itself. I would submit your honor. Now, because using the same scenario. Using the same set of facts, yes. Using the same scenario I just mentioned, can you also say that there is an overlap with respect to Section 7 of the same law which punishes conspiracy to commit terrorism? Yes, Your Honor. So a single act can now be penalized under Section 6, facilitating Section 7, conspiracy to commit terrorism, or Section 12, um, material support, providing material support under the Anti-Terrorism Act. And even if I may add the Section 4, Your Honor. All right. Can the court clarify the interrelation of these offenses through jurisprudence? I and also their proper application for criminal prosecution. Well, that may be in other laws. In our sub we submit that as far as this law is concerned, given the very nebulous, overbroad, and vague definition of terrorism, we submit that no amount of uh, construction by the court could save it. All right. Thank you, um, Attorney John. Can I call on Attorney Ursua? Thank you. Now let's go to the uh, powers of the Anti-Money Laundering Council. Uh, petitioners claim that the AMLC's authority to issue freeze orders under Section 36 violates the constitutional guarantee against unreasonable searches and seizures because it is not issued by a judge. Sorry, Is Sorry, the freezing of assets yes, a judicial Honor. function? Yes, Your Honor. Now, can you compare the authority of the AMLC to issue freeze order under Section 36 with the freeze order under Section 10 of the Anti-Money Laundering Act as amended? Uh, Your Honor, under Section 36 of the ATA, uh, the ATC, or rather the AMLC, can... Uh, order the freezing or again, yes, can direct the freezing of the accounts or investments even without court authorization on the basis alone of uh, the designation by the ATC. Uh, in Section 10 of RA 10168, which uh, penalizes uh, financing of uh, terrorism, the AMLC can also uh, freeze the uh, accounts or investments of uh, a person, ex parte, Your Honor. Even without, without the court order. Yes, right. Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. How about an, under an, uh, the Anti Money Laundering Act? Under the Anti-Money Laundering Act, Your Honor, I believe that the freeze order uh, can be made only upon court authorization with exceptions. All right. And you would agree that the Terrorism Financing Prevention and Suppression Act of 2012, uh, the constitutionality of that law has not been assailed? That is correct, Your Honor. Now, Section 35 of the Anti-Terrorism Act authorizes the AMLC to inquire into or examine deposits and investments of those prescribed or designated terrorists. Is this function of the AMLC also a judicial function? Yes, Your Honor. It is a submission of the petitioners that it is a judicial function. Now, can you compare this authority under Section 35 with how the AMLC inquires or examines bank deposits under Section 11 of the AMLA? Well, the problem, Your Honor, is that while in the past the court has uh, rendered decisions questioning the constitutionality of Section 11 uh, of, of RA10168, the decisions of the court uh, focus solely on the ex parte application uh, by the uh, AMLC for the issuance of bank inquiry orders. But the court has not had occasion to rule on whether the ex parte examination uh, by the MLC of 
uh, rather the examination by the NOC of deposits or investments without any court uh, authorization is constitutional and valid. And so, and so for that reason, Your Honor, what the petitioners are uh, submitting before this court in these cases is that the court should look not only actually at uh, Section 35 and Section 36 of the ATA, but also related provisions or provisions of related law such as RA 10168. Now, would you agree that there are also instances when searches are reasonable even when warrantless? And case law has enumerated some known jurisprudential instances of um, reasonable warrantless searches and seizures. Yes, Your Honor, but uh, the same cannot be compared with the, uh, the examination uh, conducted by the AMLC under the ATA, Your Honor. We submit that the, the search uh, or the examination, which is equivalent to a search actually, being conducted by the AMLC under the ATA is unreasonable and therefore unconstitutional. Now, would you agree that one of the exceptions is uh, exigent and emergency circumstances? Yes, Your Honor, but we also believe that that does not justify the giving the AMLC, uh, Your Honor, unbridled power to make an examination of bank records without court intervention. Would you consider an impending threat of terrorism as an exigent or emergency circumstance which would allow the freezing or examination of the bank accounts of a terrorist or his financier despite the absence of judicial warrant? Without, not without, uh, not without, Your Honor, violating due process. But this is an exception under the um, case of uh, people versus coaget. Yes, Your Honor, we agree that uh, it is an exigency. However, we question that, Your Honor. Uh, under the ATA, we believe that the AMLC should follow uh, Section 3, your, Section 2, Your Honor, of Article 3 of the Constitution. We believe that it's an unreasonable search. The anyway, power that is given to the AMLC. Anyway, can you elaborate this in your memorandum? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, thank you very much, Attorney Orsu. What can I thank call you, on Honor. Congressman Lagman? Good afternoon, Congressman. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Now, my question is, Section 29 of the Anti-Terrorism Act allows the arrest of a person suspected of committing any of the, the acts penalized under Sections 4 to 12 of the Anti-Terrorism Act, even without a warrant. Now, is there, is there a case law which holds that a legislative measure is presumed to be in harmony with the Constitution? and that every intendment of constitutionality must be read in its favor? Yes, Your Honor. That is the basic. Can we not Ho harmonize? However, however, you, okay. however Your answer. Honor, under the Constitution, a warrant of arrest shall issue only upon probable cause determined personally by the judge. In other words, any warrant issued by the executive agency cannot be consistent with the Constitution because the, the validity of a warrant of arrest should comply to three basic conditions. One, it should be issued by the judge. Two, upon probable cause. And personally determined by the judge. The, the, the section uh, 29, the ATA, has no saving grace whatsoever because it directly violates the Constitution. So you do not think that uh, section 29 can be harmonized with the Constitution and that uh, to arrive at the interpretation that a person who may be arrested or detained without a warrant refers not to a mere suspect but a suspect who is found to be in flagrante delicto or one who is arrested because based on personal knowledge of the arresting officer, there is probable cause that he or she is the perpetrator. 
Well, in this case, Your Honor, the intention of the law is to create a, a fourth instance of warrantless arrest. That is the uh, seizure of the person who is suspected of committing acts of terrorism upon the authorization of the uh, ATC. However, uh, Your Honor, with respect to warrantless arrest, time is of the essence. It is critical that the person who committed a crime or is about to commit a crime or is committing a crime would have to be arrested in flagrant delicto or in hot pursuit. But in the case of uh, Section 27, when the, when the law provides that the uh, arresting officer should force secure uh, an, a written order from the of detention from the ATC, then, then that time is not of the essence, which would fall under the three instances provided for under uh, uh, the section uh, uh, five, rule uh, 113 of the rules of court. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Can I call on Attorney Molo? Good afternoon, Tony Molo. Good afternoon, Your yes. Honor. Yeah, Article 3, Section 6 of the Constitution permits the impairment of the right to travel in the interest of national security, public safety, or public health, as may be provided by law. Isn't terrorism a national security or public safety matter that may be considered by Congress to restrict the right to travel? Yes, Your Honor. Terrorism is a, is a lawful subject that may be the subject of legislation to limit a constitutional right, but the limitation must still comply with what the Honorable Court has stated regarding uh, the Bill of Rights. All right. Under the third paragraph of Section 34 of the Anti-Terrorism Act, when an accused charge of terrorism has been granted bail because the evidence of guilt is not strong, May his freedom of movement still nonetheless be limited to within the municipality or city where he or she resides or where the case is pending. Yes, Your Honor. And that is particularly odious in uh, Section 34. Why? Because here, evidence of guilt is not strong, but upon mere application of the fiscal, the judge, the, the law says, the judge shall limit the movement of the individual. How can that happen if the evidence of guilt is not already strong? In fact, Your Honor, if we limit the movement of the individual, that reminds me of this terror, which is actually a punishment under the revised penal code. So how can, a, how can it, we have a law that allows an individual who, according to the prosecution, cannot be proven to have committed it because evidence of guilt is not strong, and yet the law allows the fiscal upon mere application to limit movement, and the law says the judge shall do so. That is why, Your Honor, we also raise it as part of the grounds that this law turns judges into rubber stamps because of the phraseology of the law. Therefore, it is diminishing the judiciary. Now, cannot Congress through law pass special limitations on a bail grant in the interest of national security or public safety, considering that what is involved here is terrorism? Um, yes, Your Honor, I can answer that um, question in two levels. Conceptually, yes, they can pass laws, but always in compliance with the Constitution. And second, never in a matter that concerns the procedure before the courts. And this concerns procedure before the courts. Your Honours, if I may, there will always be an existential threat facing every generation. There, 
each generation, if we look at history in this country, all over the world, there will always be an existential threat. But the purpose, the very purpose of the Bill of Rights, according to Justice Daxon, as enunciated here in this jurisdiction under Philippine Blooming Mills, the very purpose of a Bill of Rights is to remove certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, a right to speech, assembly, religion, association. These do not depend on any election. If Congress can, by mere legislature, change all of that, then what are the Bill of Rights for? Okay, my last question is, wouldn't you consider these restrictions as a policy matter that should be left to the wisdom of the legislature? Uh, um, yes, uh, Your Honor, I would respond to that um, in two levels. First, it, it, it sounds to me like a question of political question. The classic definition of political question is Baker v. Carr. And in Baker v. Carr, the primary requisites are there must be a constitutional commitment as found in constitutional texts, that the matter has been committed to another branch of government, for example, impeachment. It has been assigned to Congress. That does not apply here, especially with Section 29. The textual commitment is to judges, to the judiciary. Warrants must be determined personally by the judge. So the reverse actually applies. The second element, Your Honors, in um, Baker versus Carr is that there lacks any discoverable judicial standards to guide the honorable court to determine the controversy. We have judicial standards, Your Honor. They're the Bill of Rights and the entire body of jurisprudence enacting the Bill of Rights. These are judicial and they have already been discovered over the decades. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Molo. That would be all, Chief. Thank, thank you. you, Your Honor. Uh, Justice uh, Marvick Donen is the next interpolator. Now, as agreed upon with the other members of the court, we will adjourn at 5.30 today, no? And then we'll have the resetting probably next week. Can I have uh, Professor Molo again at the podium? Professor? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, there is always an existential threat uh, to every generation, but you think that it might be irresponsible for us not to allow Congress to try to find the balance to address both the existential threat as well as protection to the rights that are enshrined in the Constitution. Yes, Your Honor. So in other words, uh, we cannot assume that just because there is a law, that there is al already a challenge to the Bill of Rights. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And it is also right for us as a body that has been constituted only as the judiciary to assume that the members of the House, the Senate, and even the President is very aware of all the provisions in the Constitution. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And therefore, that uh, they may have already seen, uh, in fact, predicted, that there will be at least one petition, perhaps they did not predict that it will be 37 and more, that will be filed in the Supreme Court whenever they try to address uh, the perils of terrorism. Is that not correct? Um, yes, Your Honor. Yes. We might. And therefore, um, well, you quoted Justice Jackson. Is that a Filipino justice? No, Your Honor, but yes. his potential was already Yes, but why should we listen to Justice Union. Jackson? The, it's the Philippine flag that flies over the Supreme Court because I, I noticed that you are fond of citing Jackson, Baker versus Carr, U.S. versus Steve, Stevenson. These are not jurisprudence here. Is that not correct? Your Honor, uh, yes. yes. You might you have correct. as well cited South African jurisprudence or Indian jurisprudence, but as far as we are concerned, as I will show you later, we have had our own interpretation of actual case. And the, the more recent one, is that not correct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Yes, okay. Yes. So, in other words, uh, the court has maintained a policy of de deference uh, simply because of the nature of the court itself. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. 
And, uh, well, for example, there is this case of the AITA that was mentioned by, I think, Attorney Latif. But uh, my question is related to your share of the oral arguments. Isn't that the actual case? The AITAs? Were yes, the AITAs were charged with provisions of terrorism. Provisions that are found under Republica 111469, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Isn't that the actual case? Yes, Your Honor. Isn't that the perfect case that will delimit the actual challenge to clear provisions in the Constitution based upon clear facts? Because as far as we are concerned, uh, for example, you mentioned that there was this uh, post saying that some members of the UP community were uh, communists that were captured or killed. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And in fact, one of the lawyers there, I know him, Rafael Aquino, came out and said, I am neither captured nor killed. I yes, was never captured nor killed because here I am, right? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And what happened to that? Uh, I believe, Your Honor, uh, it was withdrawn, was correct? Council here. Yes, he, yes it was withdrawn, correct? Yes, it was right. withdrawn, yes. And the Secretary of National Defense apologized. Is that not correct? Yes. In fact, he fired or I think he uh, demoted or removed uh, the J-2. Uh, yes, Your Honor. J-2 is, I think, part of the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces, and that is number two. Yes, Your If Honor. I'm not, no, I think number, yeah, it's two. Number three, because one is, I think, operations, if I'm not mistaken. Two is intelligence. And in fact, even a deputy of the spokesperson also took a leave because of that snafu. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And it is maybe not for this court to base its ruling on that set of facts because that is not the case. It evolved and the government itself corrected its error. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And uh, with respect to uh, frozen assets, there is the case of rural missionaries. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. As a matter of fact, I heard one of the counsels today say, I cannot state anything about that case because she is not the counsel to the case. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And we are to rule on a constitutionality of the provision of uh, freezing of assets on the basis of facts, which are in another case, and which can be pending with the Court of Appeals. Is that not correct? I believe the RMPs are you mentioned consolidated rural, with this You case. mentioned rural missionaries. You mentioned Facebook posts. You mentioned red tagging. All of them can ripen to actual cases that can be filed either with this court, if they so wish, based on Geos versus Summer, however, with a warning, or with the lower courts. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So... You are now asking this court to rule upon a law that is live, that has many, that has already, according to you, have had many consequences. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Now, so therefore, the concept, I think many of us have difficulty, although we understand the, the positions of many of the petitioners, we understand the fears, Personally, I truly understand the kinds of fears that you're undergoing, having undergone those fears myself when I was a public interest lawyer. I understand that. But with the heart now of a justice of this court and with this judiciary, I think it is correct for us to assume that we should be careful not to become a political department. Is that not correct? Of course, Your Honor. Not to substitute our political wisdom to the political wisdom of, let us say, those that have crafted this law and those that have advised the president, including the national security advisor, who I believe is in the, in the room, is he here? The national security advisor, we have allowed him to be present, um, give advice to the president and perhaps even to some key leaders of Congress. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. Yes. So, only in an actual case where it can be clear, there can be a clear and convincing demonstration that there is repugnancy with the specific text in the Constitution, will there be an act by this court? Is that not correct? 
Not necessarily, Your Honor. I beg to disagree. Of course, we do allow facial So Francisco versus House of Representatives. When was this case promulgated? Your Honor. Francisco versus House of Representatives. When was this promulgated? Uh, Your Honor, this 2003. I believe it's the, the, the video. 2003. Yes, Your right? Honor. Southern Hemisphere. When was this promulgated? After the 1990. 2010. Dicini. When was this promulgated? As, as 2014. Well, Imbong. When was this promulgated? Uh, I failed to recall the actual. Did you ever mention Gio Samar? When was this promulgated? I believe two years ago, Your Honor. 2018, right? And who was the ponente? Uh, the, um, the amicus. Amicus. And this court, of course, when I was absent, I could have voted also to, for him to become amicus. But he's now amicus. Isn't that a signal? Perhaps it is, correct? Yes, so sir. now, Gios was 2018, right? Yes, and sir. none of you have mentioned the slew of cases that followed Gios. And I will show you there in the PowerPoint that there were cases like National Federation of Hog Racers. There was the case of a, a Provincial Bus Operators Association. There. Falsis versus Civil Registrar, uh, Registrar General, where the Solicitor General won in that case on same-sex marriage. By the way, do you know the ponente of Falsis? It was you, Your Honor. Yes. And then Provincial Board uh, <laughs> Bus Operators. All of them, by the way, are unanimous decisions of this court. Let's look at the last case, Parkon Song versus Lilia Parkon, where the court said, in terms of the extraordinary jurisdiction of the court, can we flash that quote? This is again, Article 8, Section 1 of the Constitution, which specifies that courts may act upon any grave of abuse of discretion by any governmental branch does not license this court to issue advisory opinions. Apart from an actual case or controversy, this court must be satisfied that the reliefs prayed for require the resolution of a constitutional issue. But there is an exception, of course, in Parkon Song. Are you aware of the exceptions? Again, this yes, is sir. part of a unanimous decision of this court, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. So, therefore, it is clear that it again reiterated the case of Southern Hemisphere. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. In Southern Hemisphere, however, it is not that freedom of expression is alleged as having been violated. Not only that, there is an additional requirement, correct? Yes, Your Honor. That there must be a clear showing of overbreath, right? Yes, Your Honor. And there's a difference between overbreath and void for vagueness. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Can you make a differentiation? Void for vagueness, Your Honor, offends uh, the due process clause in the sense that two reasons. One, it deprives fair notice to the individual on what the criminal behavior is. And as clearly stated in a ponentia, I, if I'm not mistaken, by Justice Ardelesa, void for vagueness, because it applies only for the due process clause, requires as applied. There must be actual facts, correct? So what we are talking about when we invoke the exception in Southern Hemisphere is overbreath of a provision that will run afoul the freedom of expression clause. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. But that was qualified. So Southern Hemisphere was way back in 2010, correct? Yes, sir. And there is now this, again, unanimous decision of this court in Spark versus Quezon City, which you mentioned, right? Yes, sir. And uh, I think the Ponentia, Ponente, Ponente herself Would quoted be. a very clear statement in that provision. It is not that it appears void to the petitioner. It is not that it appears void to the petitioner, but that it, there must be a clear and convincing showing that there cannot be any other interpretation except that it will infringe a, a, a certain right. Is that not correct? Well, Your Honor, I would, with due respect to my former professor in constitutional law, disagree that facial challenges only follow that line. There are, there are also facial challenges that have more recently been recognized. Name one. Your Honor, in, uh, I think because the formulation you are referring to is Salerno. Lloyd and Nicolás. Yes, Your Honor. There were facts. Yes, Your Honor. They were excluded yes, from sir. the campaign, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So there were facts. Yes, Your Honor. Right? 
So now, do you have facts? Yes, Your Honor. What facts have been established the, the, by evidence? The operative fact in a facial challenge, Your Honor, is the passage of the offending law against I'm sorry, the text of again, the Constitution, Your Honor. Again, well, just today, in the case of Diraugo versus um, Martires, this court again reiterated that line, dismissing a petition outright on a challenge to memorandum order number one, very clearly stating that it cannot just be the law, but there has to be facts that that arise in order that we act on our power of judicial review. Just the passage of a law, I think this was the, uh, the generous wording in Francisco versus House of Representatives, but then again came Southern Hemisphere, and then after that, Geo Samar, then after that, Parkon Song, then after that, all of those cases, including the case of Spark. You yes, seem to have missed all that jurisprudence. Well, Your Honor, of course, I would agree with you. Of course, Your it's Honor. understandable because one of your petitioners is really the ponente yes, of Your Honor. Southern Hemisphere, correct? Yes, Your Honor. But even her ponentia was very, very clear. Yes, Your Honor. And it was clarified further by other cases which evolved based on the history of this country and based on the jurisprudence of this court. Is that not right? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So, if I may, what are your facts? Yes, Your Honor. If Real I may. Facts, Yes, Your Honor. What are the facts? Your Honor, that Congress has in fact passed a law that violates the Constitution. That's not, that's not a fact. Your Honor, that's unfortunately, the passage of if we follow your line of thinking, then we would be erasing no, it's not my the line. distinction it is not between my line. as applied challenges. Excuse me, counsel. It is not my line. I'm sorry. I have shown you the genealogy of jurisprudence. Yes, Your Honor. Baka nga lumabas sa bar yan kung ano, di ba? It's not a tip. But in any case, the point there is, there is that line of jurisprudence. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So how do you contend with that? For the court clearly said, it is not merely the passage of a law that entitles a person that will come out up here to annul that law. Because otherwise, it's an advisory opinion. We act as a third chamber of the legislature over and above the approval power of the president. When we act upon a law without the facts, precisely the judiciary was created in order to be able to look at evidence that generates facts which may have been overlooked by the legislature and the president when they passed the law or to help clarify the text of the law. In the absence of those facts, it is up to the president when implementing the law to pass implementing rules to guide the execution of a particular law. But it seems to me that even implementing rules of the president, uh, no, here, the ATC, uh, because it clarifies concepts such as um, designation and delisting, because it clarifies concepts like inciting and advocacy, that you want that annulled even, disregarded. And you want us to focus on the law and instead of giving liberality to the political departments to do what is right by the constitution, you want us to exercise our power to jump the gun and simply say the law is unconstitutional. Well, Your Honor, if I may answer the line of questioning of the Honorable Esteemed Justice. But there is no question yet. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, isn't that what you want to do? Your Honor, we are invoking expanded judicial review. In 1987, when Justice Cecilia Munoz Palmi delivered her closing remarks, again, with due respect, to, with due respect to Cecilia Munoz Palma, when she made that speech for the Constitutional Convention, that was 1987, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And how many years have passed since 1987? 34 years. And there is a constitution that has to address everything that happens in our historical timeline from 1987 to 2021. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And now in 2021, it is this court that sits. Yes, Your Honor. So you want us to forget all the jurisprudence that has been evolved from 1987 to 2021 and simply disregard all of this advice to petitioners. Come to court only if you have the facts. If it is irrefutable, 
come to court only if you have a freedom of expression case when you want a facial challenge, but show to us clearly and convincingly that the political departments cannot interpret it in any other way except to cheer and to violate the right of freedom of expression. Do we have that now? Yes, we do, Your Honor. Yes, we do. In spite of the implementing rules? Yes, yes Your Honor. For because instance? For, for example, Your Honor, let's go into the subject of chilling of speech. The sword of Damocles, the damage under constitutional law is not because it falls, it's because it hangs. The passage of the law may not cause a direct harm, but the harm, for example, professor, on the professors. Professor, if I, if I show to you a law passed in 1939, which is broader than the provisions here, um, but did not cause a chilling effect despite the broad provisions, would you say the chilling effect must also be something that must be clearly and convincingly shown to us? For example, yes, I show you the provision on inciting to sedition. 1939. 1939, inciting to sedition, clearly said inciting. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, where is it? Yon, inciting. Tends to. That's even a broader uh, provision. That's 1939. Yet, Professor, what happened in 1986? We had a revolution, Your Honor. And the revolution consisted of people going to the streets in, in, in mass, mass waves. Even 1983, 84, 85, then 2000 also happened. Then many other things happened despite of this provision on inciting to sedition. Yes, Your Honor. The provisions are a bit broad, correct? Yes, Your Honor. In but, spite of it being in the statute books, it was not enough to chill the entire population that went to EDSA in 1986. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Now, you are claiming that the provisions in Section 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 chills. Yes, Your Honor. That is your best argument to invoke Southern Hemisphere, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. What's the difference with this provision? Well, if we look at the sedition, which is the predicate crime of inciting to sedition, Your Honor, we know what the prohibited conduct is. Oh, really? We are looking Let at us people look at, rising to multiple Excuse me, Professor. Sorry. Let us look at the article on sedition and see how dangerous it might be to prevent the promulgation or execution of any law or the holding of popular election, to prevent the national government or any provincial or municipal government or any public officer thereof from freely exercising its or his function or prevent the correction of any administrative error. You know my prediction? If you were alive in 1939, you would have filed a petition with the court. Yes, Your Honor. But yes. I would also point to the first part. But you see what I am aiming at? Yes, what I am aiming at is, should there now be a sort of a limitation on what is meant by chill uh, in terms of freedom of expression? Unless you want this court to be so powerful that in spite of some provisions in the Anti-Terrorism Act, where it tries to find a balance, regardless of how the word, wordings are, so, for example, in Section 4, subparagraph E, correct? Yes, sir. There are provisions there which says where it will not apply, correct? Yes, sir. And the provisions are also qualified. Is that not correct? Section E. Yes, sir. Right? So, it, it, the, it says that uh, the, the qualification in subparagraph E says that it will not apply. Next, uh, next slide, please. Provided that terrorism, as defined in this section, shall not include advocacy, protest, dissent, stoppage of work, industrial or mass actions. My God, this is even better than the inciting to sedition provision. Don't you see, Council? Yes, Your Honor. Because it, it carves out an exception. And the carved out exception there is advocacy, protest, dissent, stoppage of work, industrial or mass action, etc., are not included in acts of, of terrorism, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So isn't this better? 
it actually makes it worse, Your Honor, because now you have the definition of terrorism directly covering civil and political rights, and all the prosecutors no, 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 really need to do is attach the last. It says there, terrorism as defined in this section shall not include. Baka your copy did not have not. Yes, Your Honor, but after that is except those which are not except intended. Except which are intended to, to cause, cause death, death. Or serious physical harm. You mean to say that we should allow protests that causes death? Well, Your Honor, that is part of our assertion, Your Honor, that um, it in actually wait, 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 is the first law me. that includes. So in our sovereign guarantees that the people shall be the sovereign, we allow some people to do advocacy that causes death. Yes, Your Honor. Brandenburg versus Ohio, which is the line of questioning by uh, yeah. Justice No, Bernard. no, no. This one says advocacy. Doesn't say in incitement. Doon tayo sa incitement section 9. Uh, For here, it's only advocacy, right? Yes, so, Your Honor. You mean to say people can cause death? No, does, Your Honor. Does that not say advocacy, but not cause John Stuart Mill on liberty. Yes, Your Honor. You can but only advocacy. have the liberties for so long as you do not harm another person, correct? Yes, Your Honor. That's embedded into a liberal society, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And even I would say even a socialist one, if I may, if I may be so blunt, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So you mean to say that any of these exercises that causes death cannot be prevented by government? Your Honor, the, the provision turns on the phrase intended. It's, it doesn't say causes death. There's a difference, I believe, in exercising one's rights for advocacy of imminent lawless action versus so, something that actually causes advocacy to cause it. So, counsel, by the way, maybe let's maintain eye contact because I'm the one talking to you. Uh, okay. Sorry, you're, I was because also looking were, at the provision. You were always class. looking at other justices. Um, yes. Um, sorry, Your Honor. We're, we're the ones yes, talking. Honor. Yes. Okay. Now, intended to cause death. You mean to say government cannot prevent? We have to wait until there is somebody that dies. Oh, definitely not. That is not our purpose. So that is, I think, the, the purpose here. You can advocate. You can uh, uh, exercise your civil and political rights. Yeah. You can do mass action. You can even strike. You can even do stoppage of work. Uh, but when you, your intent is clear that you are moving towards killing somebody, government should be able to step in, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, so that can that be the interpretation of that provision? It would be, Your Honor. Yes. It would not be, but then it devolves into vagueness because the second element of vagueness is that it leaves too much arbitrary discretion. Again, to I, I think we are confusing the concept of overbreadth in freedom of expression cases and void for vagueness. Void for vagueness, again, as, we, as you yourself uh, agreed to, and you're a professor in constitutional law. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, preparing your students for the bar exam, right? Yes, Your Okay, Honor. now, void for vagueness means it must be applied, right? Yes, now, Your Honor. Again, let's apply the test in SPARC. Is there no possible interpretation at all that has been taken by government to save that? We, it is our position there is none. Wrong. So you, you are again saying that government rights. cannot step in to stop a kind of action where the intention is to cause death upon another. It is, Your Honor. So when somebody, when groups of people are out there calling death to Leonin, as I come out, okay, death to Leonin, and you can see that they are about to kill me, government should not step in. That is not an act of terrorism, right? It is punishable under a different crime, Your Honor. Under? A different crime, Your Honor. If someone is going to kill you, Your Honor. Yes, that one. It says intended to cause death. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, but like if that would be the case, then we attempted would Attempted murder, frustrated murder, yes, attempted homicide, frustrated homicide. That can be the interpretation there, correct? Your Honor, it punishes terrorism under a different law, and therefore... You've seen the attacks on the Capitol in Washington, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. That was a throng of people. And they were... Uh, you do not know which ones of them would want to seriously harm or cause serious death, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And not serious death. Cause death, because any death is serious, correct? Yes. So, therefore, you mean to say that government cannot stop 
that from happening? Well, of course not, Your Honor. That, isn't that the intention there? Well, that would be, Your Honor, yes. an entire government is built on good intentions, but we really have to measure them on what... Every law offers. is based upon an intention. Yes, Every right. law is a, an imagined future. Every law provides for a no normative statement that says this should be how it is, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And no, no, no uh, language does not clearly capture everything. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And whatever the intentions were in this provision, isn't it the role of the judiciary to give a chance to the political department to be able to address the harm that they wish to address? before we come out immediately on a theoretical point to actually uh, to annul that provision. Your Honor, my humble submission is that deference, judicial restraint ends where the Bill of Rights begins. Yes, how does that violate the Bill of Rights? It just, it says, similar exercises of civil and political rights which are intended to cause death or serious physical harm to a person. You, if you want to read it, Looking at government as evil or demonic or with no intention at all except to do what is wrong, then you're probably right. Correct? Yes, sir. Yes. But if you were a court of law like us and you were trying to avoid imposing your own political convictions into an interpretation of a provision, but rather understanding that government really has to face certain kinds of terroristic acts. There was suicide bombing in Holo, correct? Yes, Your Honor. There were uh, several, uh, Marawi happened. And oh, yes, in my dissenting opinion, I called it terrorism. I did not call it rebellion. It happens, correct? Yes, Your Honor. In other countries, Facebook posts can cause a riot as it did in Bangladesh or India. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. In the United Washington. States, post-truth committed riots, in, uh, caused riots in its own capital. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. That is a reality which was not there in 1986. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And therefore, now government has to meet that challenge. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. And our, the role of the judiciary now is what? Your Honor, if there is a clear conflict between the means created by government to meet a new challenge vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution's text. The role of the judiciary is to find what the Constitution means because it is precisely here within these four walls but a that clear, this honorable court a decides. A clear conflict cannot be theoretical, meaning to say we read the constitutional provision, we read the legal provision, correct? The legal provision can bear, again, spark, can bear an interpretation which can be legitimate. Shouldn't we wait for the actual case? Maybe the ITA case is the actual case. Um, Your Honor, Maybe rural missionaries is the actual case. Maybe Gabriela is the actual case. Maybe this uh, DND accord with the UP, I don't know, might be the actual case. But we have to see how government reacts. And the only thing that we see now is the constitution, the law, and the implementing rules and regulations. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And should the court now weigh in when it has not been yet, well, it's there, it is, uh, it is now law of the land, should, should we not wait until there is a clear case? Perhaps there can be a petition filed on those that are red tagged. And perhaps the fact should be very clear. Goes to a regional trial court first so that the regional trial court can weigh in, by the way, counsel. Can regional trial courts declare unconstitutionalities of provisions? Yes, Your Honor. Definitely, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And the advantage of regional trial courts, as opposed to the Supreme Court, is that the regional trial courts can receive evidence for it to be certain of the facts that provides the ambience, that provides the context for interpreting a provision. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. So, my, uh, again, can you honestly tell us that we can step in with our power of judicial review, considering all of this? Yes, Your Honor. Why? Your Honor, there is already a clear conflict. There are two dimensions in this case. The civil liberties dimension, 
which can be met by a facial challenge even within the parameters of GeoSummer and Southern Hemisphere. And then there's a separate separation of powers dimension. Your Honours, the judiciary is called I'm sorry, the Counselor, branch, Your Honour. I have no idea what the dimensions you are. Can, can you again? Yes, Your Honour. I, I may, if, if you may yes. allow me, I can elaborate. We filed our petition thinking of not just violation of the Bill of Rights, but also violation of the separation of powers under Section 29 of the ATA. Again, Counselor, let me ask you. Congress is not concerned with the Bill of Rights. It's concerned, of course, Your Honor. President is not concerned about the Bill of Rights. Oh, Your Honor, of course, our president is concerned with the Bill of Rights. Really? You of say that? Yes. Okay, now, the yeah. army is not concerned about the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Of course, I have to presume that our the armed police forces... are, are yes, concerned about the Bill of Rights. Yes, Your Honor. And interpreting any law, they will always have in mind the Bill of Rights, even if it's not written in the law, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So shouldn't we wait until they actually do an act that violates the Bill of Rights? Your Honor, when the law itself is clearly against the Bill of Rights, Your Honor, then it is not for us to withhold, really, under expanded judicial review, Your Honor. That is our position. But we get, uh, Your Honor, and we will certainly address the very incisive line of questioning, Your Honor, in our memorandum. I don't think it's incisive because it's all in the genealogy of the court. This yes, court. Your Honor in a unanimous way has already said that there must be a clear actual case. Yes, we have fears of any law. Yes, we have fears of any government. Uh, it's understandable. But to ask the Supreme Court to move in and use its powers without that, that standard would invite us to insert our own political perspective into how a law should be. I hope you understand that. I understand yes. completely, Your Honor, and uh, I appreciate the line of question. But because of the advice of the chief, it's 5.30. You can, you can have uh, one week to research on that point. And I will, <laughs> yes, Your Honor. We will call you again. Yes, Your Honor. We will, we will continue Tuesday. This time at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It will be all right. Yeah. Uh, we will start earlier. So that will be okay. So it's already 5.30. We will now adjourn the session today. Okay, let us start. Okay. Session is adjourned. We are so pleased that we the session hall.